Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 101, two years in, second anniversary AMA. I'm Sean from Hamilton, and from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, welcome to our slightly delayed two-year anniversary episode. Now, first off, fair warning, I am still not feeling 100%. I do have to apologize for any unintentional illness-related noises during this episode. I know my voice is a little rough, and I'll be trying to mute where possible, but something may get through, especially for those of you here live. Now, on July 29, 2018, the first ever episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast hit podcatchers around the world. Tonight, we're going to host a live AMA where we'll be answering questions from our chat room, the lobby. Uh, in particular, tonight, I'm looking for questions about what we've learned in the last two years. Now, in addition, I've got a detailed review of Quad Heroes, a game from a Canadian game designer that has really smitten my oldest daughter. I've also got some thoughts on the new Shadowrun 6th edition beginner box and a bit about Gen Con Online once we get to our week in review. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we receive, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Now, most of the feedback I've gotten this last week has, of course, been people wishing me well after canceling last week, and I do have to thank everyone for that. I'm still not 100%, and just before we launched the show, I went and looked, and I still haven't got my COVID test results, but I will say I'm feeling better than I was a week ago. Well, as for comments on our gaming content, up first, we've got a comment from Rage Badger Gaming, commenting on our YouTube actual play of Gloomhaven Scenario 14. Always get excited for this one a fun scenario, and, of course, the final unlocked at the end. Although it didn't matter, at 1 hour, 1 minute, and 41 seconds, <laughs> plus poison, so 3. You actually double everything, so poison damage does get doubled on a crit. Didn't make a difference here, but always useful to know going forward. Well, thanks for the comment, Rage Badger Gaming. Uh, I do remember getting the poison rules wrong at first, and Temujin, our guy in the chair, correcting us, but that was in regards to healing. The, the first healing that hits you just removes the potion, poison and doesn't heal you at all. I, I don't remember if we'd figured this one out eventually or not, either way, but thanks for the tip. Um, hopefully, we'll remember this whenever we actually get back to playing the Gloomhaven again. Now, speaking of Gloomhaven, I did get my hands on a copy of Jaws of the Lion. Thank you very much, Tabletop Renaissance, Windsor's newest local gaming store. If I was feeling 100%, I would be pointing you towards the unboxing video right now. But sadly, I haven't had a chance to record that yet. It is coming, though, hopefully in the next week. Uh, for those listening on the podcast, there's a good chance it might be up on YouTube now. Well, sticking with YouTube comments, Cat Stacker had this to say on our Robotech Tactics unboxing video. It's a good deal at $20 for a bunch of minis to play Battletech with. Well, thanks for the comment, Cat Stacker, though I'm not sure if I agree with you on this one. The models in this game are nuts, like just insane. I have had it confirmed that what they did was take bond Bandai scale model kits and shrink them down. That is literally what they did to create these. These are insane. The smallest bits I have ever seen on a plastic sprue. And I just don't think it's worth the frustration versus picking up just fully assembled Battletech minis because they have those Lance box sets. They cost about 15 bucks. You get four mechs, they're fully assembled and they come with stack cards for both core Battletech and Alpha Strike. And I got to say like versus the frustration of trying to build one of those Battleloids, I would just go with the Battletech minis. Well, again, sticking with YouTube, Levi Moat left a comment on our Horizons Extermination Review. 
The design reason for including missions is to create some hidden information in the game because the game ends when a player places their final colony. Having perfect information meant players could stall the game and games would last far too long. The mission cards solved this problem but created an entirely new one. As previously discussed, balancing the mission's VPs is a nightmare because they are so intensely situational. I rebalanced them a half dozen times during the 300 plus playtests we did. If I were to go back and redesign the mission cards, I think I would base them entirely on things that are controllable by the player rather than having mm -hmm. some based on game states as they are now. Suggestions are definitely encouraged. Well, thank you for the time to comment, Levi. Now, for those who don't recognize the name, Levi is the lead designer on Horizons and Extermination, who actually joined us for our review. So we've been kind of going back and forth on this game for a little while now. Now, hearing this, I get it. I, I understand why missions were included. I could totally see, having played Horizon a number of times, that if there wasn't hidden information, the game could go on forever where everyone just tries to stop whoever's in the lead. So I get it. So I, I see that. Um, but I do think the idea of making them player actions is solid. Like that makes more sense than basing them on game state. Though I'm not that upset about the game state, but I, what I think he needs is a rule that's from Takanoko, which is another game that has um, various victory point cards that can be based on how the board certain currently looks at the time and that is that if you draw a mission card and it's already complete so whatever the game state is matches what's on the card you can't keep it you can't be like oh look there's already three ice planets out i just score three points boom done i'm lucky no instead it's removed from the game and you draw a new card now this stops people from grabbing missions just hoping for a lucky break and not actually having done any work now you played um horizons without extermination be it at cg realm do you have any suggestions for levi yeah, unfortunately, it's been a while since I've played this. And while I do recall the frustrations with VP balance, I, I, I remember that this was you know, a real issue that we had and I had at the time, uh, I think I would, I would need a refresher before I felt confident enough sure. to make useful suggestions. Up next, a comment from Alan Brookland on our Goris Maximus review, specifically about the over-the-top artwork. I'm one who loves the artwork, but I understand your point as does Connor. They have announced the family-friendly version. They redid the art as ocean animals, plus they mirrored the numbers and points so they're visible either way up. It's open for pre-order at the moment at insideupgames.com slash our-games slash c-change. And we'll drop that note into the chat. Oh, thank you for that, Alan. I had no clue that Connor was even working on a retheme. That's awesome to see. Not only that he's got a, a more family-friendly art version, but also having the, so your cards can go either way up. That's really cool. Well, up next, a comment on our talks about culling games. Ralph Mazza says, my basement is Hotel California for games. <laughs> games come in, but don't come out. I'm amused. Uh, and then we have, a in relation to that topic, Yuho Rutila, the patron who originally asked the question, wrote to say, thanks for great take on the issues and sorry for bombarding with multiple, almost the same questions. <laughs> the question was on my mind at some point and I wasn't actually any more sure if I had asked it already. There was no digital trace of it as I did it through the website. Maybe some kind of automatic notice about successful question into the email would help us with absent minds. Thanks for the great show and cheers for making it to 100. Oh, thanks, Yuho. Uh, glad you appreciate our answers to your question. Now, in regard to more feedback for the questions, this is something I've been struggling with literally going back to the when we first started this whole thing. Like, I have an Excel sheet, and it's the same one I started with I still use, and I keep track of all the questions. But I And I'm just not sure what follow-up I should be doing at that point. Like, if I answer your question, you send in a question, I answer it in the next couple of weeks, great. I'm, I'm going to be sure to follow you up. I'm like, hey, you asked this. I got back to you. Here's your answer. And here's some other questions we did that are on the same topic. That's great. But then it feels weird, like, if if I don't answer the question for a while. Like, we don't always get to everything right away. We have a big pile of questions, and we pick whatever's best appropriate or whatever looks fun. Or if you're a patron, sometimes you get bumped to the top and so on. But if you're really weird, if I suddenly wrote someone a year and a half later to say, hey, remember in 2018 when you wrote me about six-player games? Well, we finally answered that. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd feel like that almost would be almost more insulting. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on what we could do to... So 
I, I think part of it depends on how you read the question from Rutila. Um, or you uh, I think the easiest, if not best solution, uh, would be when you get that question and you're going to put it on the, the uh, spreadsheet, mm -hmm. if it makes it onto the spreadsheet, say, hey, we've, put the, we've added this to the, quest, the, the, the spreadsheet and your question is in queue, or hey, we've already got this question, but we're going to put your name in as someone else who asked it, or okay. sorry, we, asked this, we answered this two, two years ago, try again. Uh, you know, just, just some sort of feedback right then as you're putting it onto the spreadsheet so that okay. they know if you're in the queue or not. See, the whole thing, I put like everything on the spreadsheet. The only thing I worry about then is I'm going to put it on the spreadsheet and we still don't get through it for two, three years. And I mean, I, I, Maybe, maybe you wouldn't say that. Yeah, like, maybe, hey, we put, we put it on the list. There's no guarantee we'll get to it, but we definitely caught yeah, your I question. Yeah, I mean, they, they know we answer one question a week. So, right. you know, if, uh, if we get all the questions we want, it could be, you know, episode 500 before we get to. Oh, no, it's true. We're, we're not question. that far ahead, but we are not short on questions right now, which is awesome. Excellent. All right, well, finally, we've got a comment on our topic of Canadian game designers. Board Game Art Creations commented to say, you need to add Bosk in there. All right, well, this is another one of those cases where I haven't actually played the game, so it wouldn't go on the list. Um, now, I have heard good things about Bosk, but I got to say, every time I hear it, all I keep thinking is it should be a Star Wars game about Trandoshan bounty hunters. <laughs> Well, as usual, we'll be sure to toss a link to where you can get this game in the uh, suggestion in the show notes. But that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. This is that point in every video where we say, like, subscribe, hit the bell, and all that. If nothing else, subscribing to our content helps the companies hosting us know that we're important to you mm -hmm. folks and that other people might like to know about us too so that maybe they'll recommend us. And same thing. It would be awesome if you took the time to leave a review on whatever podcatcher you watch us or listen to us on. I guess you don't watch us on a podcatcher. And wherever you happen to listen to us, we haven't asked for that in a long time. But you know what? If you go on iTunes or Apple, whatever it's called now, Apple Podcasts, or is it back to I don't even know anymore, yeah, they keep or Stitcher or any of those places, leaving a review does help more people see our show. We show up more on the rankings when people search tabletop gaming. We want to show up on that front page. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. I say this every week, but I'm going to keep doing it because this is the best place to keep track of everything we put out each week. On a regular week, when I'm not sick, we tend to put out something almost every day of the week. So this is a great way to get a list of what content we put out weekly, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, uh, special sales, unboxing videos, actual plays, and so on. You can sign up by going to, use, to tabletopbellhop.com and subscribe right there in the sideboard sidebar or go to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com yeah we gotta add that back in the notes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we took it out because it was broken for one day but we fixed it all right our hundredth episode giveaway uh we launched this during our last episode uh was hoping to tell you about it last week but we weren't here but there is one week left we are going to be drawing a winner next week so head over to the blog for a chance to win a copy of The Alpha from Bicycle Cards, a game about playing a wolf pack, or Dead Man's Cabal from Pandasaurus Games, a necromancer dance party in a box. We'll be drawing the winners during our live show Wednesday, August 12th. All right, today we are celebrating our two-year anniversary, not just of the podcast, but of this whole Tabletop Bellhop thing. Like our first ever blog post ever published at tabletopbellhop.com went live on June 26th, 2018. We had hoped to be celebrating this last week, but unfortunately had to delay due to illness. Now, in celebration of this milestone, we've got a special gift for one of our fans. Mark from Grand Gamers Guild has been awesome enough to donate a Kickstarter copy of their abstract game gorinto something we were both very excited about this is uh, going to be a prize for our next giveaway gorinto is an excellent abstract tile drafting game that it, with a unique japanese theme now this is a game that the entire bellhop team greatly enjoyed myself deanna sean all of us have played it and mark was cool enough to send us a preview copy last year and we all got the check now for more info on that you can check out the preview on the blog now a link to which you can find in the show notes now, this contest will be open to U.S. and Canada residents. To get a chance to win, you have to head over to tabletopbellhop.com, find the contest, and enter, enter via the raffle copter form on the webpage. 
Uh, entries will be awarded for all the usual things, right? Liking our Facebook page, tweeting, following, etc. Sorry, visiting our Facebook page. We can't ask you to like it. It'd be awesome if you did, but we can't require that. Um, as well as checking out our stuff, though, we also have some select links from Grand Gamers Guild. So we would appreciate to show your thanks to our sponsor by visiting their content as well. Um, the big thing they are going to be pushing, though, is they have a new kickstarter that's going to launch next week for endangered new species it's an expansion for their game in endangered there aren't any links on that yet because kickstarter is now two days behind on approving it so as soon as that goes live we will be throwing that in the raffle copter i'll be sure on social media to let people know when those entries are added but they're not there yet because the game's not actually up to be able to give you a link to it yet well, the winner will need to provide us with an email address, which we'll give to Mark, and then he will send them a link to the Late Pledge backer page, where they can get one Kickstarter edition of Garinto. The winner will also get an option to add on the expansion at their own cost, if they wish. Yeah, I tried to convince Mark to throw that in. He's like, no, no, I'll give him the base game. If they, if they, they want the expansion, they got to pay for that, so fair enough. Now, as a bonus, for those of you who took the time out of your day to join us live, for those of you in our chat room, the lobby, we have included a code in the chat that will give you bonus entries into this contest. Not as many as for joining us for our 100th. We can't get away with that all the time, but we do thank you for coming. Finally, a reminder that our Patreon patrons at the hotel guest or better level get five bonus entries to all our giveaways, which includes both this new Garinto giveaway and our 100th episode giveaway. Thank you, patrons. Well, we love people who we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. All right. So for those of you here live, be sure to stick around after the show as usual. I do have a package to open. I have no clue. It's very long. I'm not sure what's in there. It's, it's a significant size. We're going to open that up. And depending on how I'm feeling, we may do another quick Zoom party just to celebrate our two-year anniversary. I don't know if that'll happen. It depends how my voice is feeling at that point. But if you are interested, you can have Zoom ready. We can all join together and chat and hang out for a bit after the show. We're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Our social media works too. We're everywhere is Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best place is for questions to come through the website. That way they don't get lost. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. As part of our second anniversary celebration, we wanted to open the floor up to you, our guests, to ask whatever you wanted. All right, what I'd love to hear today, as opposed to our normal AMA topics, are questions that aren't specifically game night related. Like, I don't want to talk about our best whatever games or our favorite whatever games. We have been doing this for two years now, and what I'd like to open up to the floor is any questions that put use to the experience we've gained during that time, and for questions about Sean and I specifically. Just a chance to get to know us a bit better, not just by what games we play. Well, and to start off, we're going to get a... Uh question that came in from binks games what is right. your snack of choice all right snack of choice so again i'm not just game night but if i was just gonna have a snack it's gonna be cheese and crackers now that is not cheese and crackers with meat particularly charcuterie really um i love getting we we subscribe to the carnivore club which is a monthly meat box where they send you meat all the time. And we'll be sure to drop a link. It'll be an affiliate too, because we have an affiliate with them. We'll drop a link in the, in the show notes to our, our, our carnivore crate. It's a Canadian thing where they send you a box of meat every month. And it's all like cured meats and it's cut meats and stuff like that. That's just amazing. Um, and we have a local place called the Cheese Bar. Uh, run by a wonderful woman, Sarah, who just started going to local farmer's markets selling Ontario cheeses and now has done well enough that she has her own store in Bell River. And between those two, we get meats and cheeses and then we toss in some bread and crackers to go with it. That is by far my favorite thing to snack on. Sometimes we'll even do that for dinner. Um, the date nights that the Anna and I have been enjoying every other week uh, since quarantine and to keep sane, that's what Deanna and I will do is we'll build a nice big charcuterie board with lots of meat, cheese and breads, have some craft beers and play some board games. For me, my go-to is, well, salty anything to some degree, but uh, primarily potato chips. Uh, okay. I, I was brought up in a potato chip family, and it never went away. Uh, although I have to say, I have been drifting more towards uh, flavored pretzels. Not, okay. um, not like actual like 
big full pretzels with like the pretzel bites and the or the or the crushed pretzels with with flavoring on them. There's a couple of different brands of those. Um, uh, and as well, uh, for some reason, combos have been dirt cheap at uh, at stores lately. So I have been doing a bunch of combos as well. Just you know, that, yeah, without the meat and cheese. If I'm not doing the meat and cheese, because like that takes slicing and dicing and time. Combos are my favorite. Right. I, I just the standard cheddar cheese pretzel combos. I don't want the pizza. I don't want the weird flavors or the the the, the cracker version. I just want yeah, standard cra- cracker salty. versions of combos are wrong. They do yeah. weird things in they're, your they're mouth. Okay, but the texture the of them, the texture of them goes all wrong. Although I have to say, I do like the blue cheese version of uh, of the of the combos. Yeah, see, I don't like blue cheese normally. I can eat that. The pizza is my second favorite, right. but the standard nacho cheese combos. Yep. Plus, you have to bite them in half, and then just you like let it sit in your mouth and lick all the salt off, <laughs> and then eventually eat that. Then you got to eat the cheese tube from the middle, and then you eat the other half again, licking all the salt off first. Right. There's this there's a method to eating combos. And for some reason now, I haven't done this in years because I, I pretty much stopped drinking pop, which should shock anyone who's known me for a long period of time. I honestly cannot remember the last time I had pop, but it used to be combos and Sprite specifically. For some reason, those two went together so well. And I have fond memories. Now we're going to tie it back to gaming. Is sitting on the blue couch at my parents in the corner and reading the AD&D Monstrous Manual, the giant binder shape, and having to finish a page. So I would finish one whole page and then I would eat one combo and I would take a swig of, of a Sprite and then I could flip the page and read the next monster. And I would get so frustrated when you get to like Orcs, which was like a two page entry. And I'm like, oh, I want my combos. And that's how I pace out my combos back in the day. There you go. Uh, next question uh, comes in from uh, and we've had a few uh, tech tech in the chat room is saying uh, corn nuts. Corn uh, nuts, fair. And uh, Red Meeple Ryan's uh, putting out Cheez-Its. What are cheese? It's they're, they're, they're a cracker. They're the um, square ones. Yeah, they're a little cracker that's sort of a cheese flavored ish okay. cracker. Someone waved a brick of cheese near a cracker once and yeah. colored it. Colored <laughs> they it they orange. coated it with the orange yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd ever call them cheese flavored, but they're good. <laughs> I, I don't mind them. It's just calling them cheese seems to be a insult to cheese. Fair <laughs> enough. What are, the, there's others I like, but those are, those are definitely my favorites. The, the one I used to like, and it was um. Scott Rogers, Professor Scott Rogers from Board Games with Scott used to be one of one of the first video uh, podcatchers or whatever, vloggers, whatever you want to call it. And he was sharing the cheese flavored crackers that have peanut butter in the middle and they come four to a package and you can only get them in the States. And I'm like, I used to have these all the time, but every time I had them was when my parents would go on bowling trips and I'd go with them and we'd be in the hotel and that's what would be in the hotel vending machine or in the rest stops, like in Ohio where rest stops are literally a washroom and a bunch of vending machines, right. not like our rest stops here and getting these things. And I'm like, oh, I miss those. I'm like, I kind of want some of those. Right. Uh, we have a question from William Brown, uh, William J. Brown the third. All right. Uh, how can I be a guest on your show? All right. Uh, William's been asking me this for a little while now. William, one of William's goals is he, he is a newer content creator who keeps being shocked by how easy it is to get certain things done. Right. So one of the things he did was like, I'm small. I can't get important people on my show. And he wrote Jamie Stegmeyer of Stonemeyer Games and had Jamie on as a guest. And he's like, oh, my God, that worked. I didn't expect <laughs> it to work. And it's just one of those people who thinks the gaming industry is way bigger than it is. And I felt this way at the same time. It's it's a lot closer knit and smaller and and hobby than you would think it is so one of the things he decided is he wants to go on other shows and he figured the best way to do that was to ask people to be on so he wrote me to ask how can it be on your show and i thought this would be interesting because for our two-year anniversary i think this is particularly apt because this is something we've been talking about both in what we did in the past and what's going forward so in the past we've had three different guests on uh, we had Phil Vecchione, we had Tracy Barnett, and we had Daniel Zayas. I think that's all we had on, right? I'm not forgetting anyone. Uh, Tracy, Phil, and Daniel? Yeah, that's Yeah, it. I think those are three. So we, we had those three, and, and no insult to them, but they are three of our worst performing episodes ever. And I think there's a reason for this. And the reason is we're not an interview show. We are an answer your gaming question show with a review yep. segment, right? Like our, our main drive has always been answering your gaming and game night questions and whenever we have an interview on we kind of make up a question like 
Well, today's question is, what's Ironetta all about? Or today's question is, what's Phil doing with power, power whatever, powered by the apocalypse? Or right, we kind of had to make up a question. Hydro hackers. So, Phil did hydro hackers. <laughs> yes, Phil did hydro hackers, and many other games. But yes. like, well, actually, we spent most of that episode talking cyberpunk, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and, I mean, and well, our we, history we got and there. video yeah, we, games, and yeah, we kind of drifted over there from the hydro hackers. Uh, it, it was, and they went well enough, but it's not. I don't think it's why people listen to us. Now, that said, I think it is worth getting guests on, but I think we need to get guests on. And I don't know, I think it was Deanna who pointed this out of the three of us talking about it, is get guests on, but still stick to the format. So what I said to William was, how can he be on your show? He'd have to answer a question. I'd go through my list of questions, and hopefully there's something William J. Brown III knows about that I don't, or that Sean doesn't know about. So we would have William J. Brown on the show, to discuss the answer to one of your questions that we don't know the answer to. Right. So we've also talked uh, a couple of times, especially at the end of last show during our after show for episode 100, which all patrons can listen to at least is we talked to uh, red meeple Ryan in our chat room saying at some point we would like to have him on the show to talk about accessibility and gaming because he is a blind meeple and we are not. So he has firsthand experience. We will hopefully never have. So, it'd be a perfect person to have on to talk about that. Although now, when you were J. complaining Brown, about, I don't know exactly. The way me. you were complaining about the size of text on things. Yeah, maybe. Me that's fast. <laughs> it, it, it might be coming soon, right? But that's it. I think that we, how to be a guest on our show is going to, I, like, I don't even know if people could reach out to us. If you're an expert on something, let us know. And then like, hey, do you have any questions on this? I'd like to help you answer them. Right. Would probably be the best way if someone wanted to reach out to us to be on the show. I think more likely, Sean, Deanna, and I will sit down and go through our list of topics and go, hey, I think we could use someone else here. Like if we were, if we were going to talk about anything about accessibility or BIPOC or any of that or safety tools, I don't think we're the ones to talk about that. We'd be better off having someone else who's more of an expert on to talk about those things. Yeah, I mean, we did a talk on safety tools, but I think yeah. it could have been better with with some professionals from from that field. Exactly. Uh, and then uh, the one of the other options that I think we've tossed around about, and I don't think we've ever really come to an agreement on, other than we don't have enough time in a week, is doing a separate video, a separate interview outside of yes. the podcast where it's. You know, we sit down and we talk with them and we do an interview show, but it's not this. It's yeah. a bonus. It would be instead thing. of. Yeah. Like, heck, maybe it would replace our The Game Room. Like, me, it could maybe be a segment on the show, but it wouldn't replace the Ask the Bellhop. No, no. It, yeah, it would. And it would probably not even, like, be recorded on a Wednesday night. It would be, right. all right, let's find the time in our schedule where all of us can get together and do a, do a Zoom interview. Yeah. And then we fit it like, in. As for a, example, here's a Donald Dennis has asked me to be back on on board games again, which is pretty awesome. But Donald Dennis works at a library. He runs the games and schools and library podcast. We have at least two questions about I want to start a game club at my local library. And I'm like, I, I was thinking of that the other day. I'm like, that is a perfect connection. Like, if anyone could talk about getting games into your library, it's Donald Dennis. I can't like, I, I'm sure I could do my research and we could like that. We have enough experience and we can do the research to answer the questions ourselves, but that's where I'd want to do an interview. That's how I'd like to have guests on the show is right. that way. And I think if that does happen again, this is this, I, I I'm not promising it's going to happen soon, but I am going to try to get William on since he specifically asked um, that we are aiming for probably the second, of july but i'm gonna sit down with them and go through our questions and say hey are there any of these that you're like oh yeah i know about that and then we'll try it out um especially using zoom now we should be good especially because zoom seems to keep giving us free extra time well it but won't if, if it won't the, the time you need it to it won't I'll, yeah I'll that's the that. problem is that's <laughs> the other problem is now that we're using zoom we're limited to 45 minutes uh but i mean there's no reason we can't jump back to skype honestly it's quality wise I, i'm not really seeing that much of a difference. Um, and in, no, and in some sorry, ways, it's July actually... has already happened. I'm talking about past again. What's and... the month after August? I this quarantine. <laughs> quarantine. September second. September second. September second. Uh, no, I, I. To be honest, it's actually even easier for me to get Skype into the uh, yeah. <laughs> into the into the show anyway. So um, you know, we'll we'll see we'll see what's going on, and it depends. Somewhat it depends on what they've got equipment wise and and internet wise yeah. as well so 
all sorts. Yeah, of well, comedy. like I said, most of the, the people I've talked to already already record podcasts. What I don't know is like Donald Dennis. I don't know if he'd do video, so we may have the the um, the looming voice interview <laughs> show. And well, I mean, even we can, then, we can, once we do my, it, we'd have to come up with the format too. Yeah, I mean, get me a get me a headshot, and I'll you know we can put yeah. up a we can put up a headshot of them and, and mm -hmm. use that. There's nothing wrong with that at all if you don't want to use video. And in some ways, that's that's better because it cuts down on the bandwidth. Well, issues. yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, William J. Brown the third, and anyone else who's interested in being on the show, um, like I said, reach out. Let us know what your area of expertise is. Ask if we have any questions, or if you've been asked a question by someone, that would work too, right? Like if. If you're you're on Twitter and someone asked you a great question and you want to talk about that question, maybe our, we're, we could be a platform for you to answer that question. Yep. That would work as well. All right. Well, moving on, we've got a question here from Louis Martinez. How do you manage your schedule? <laughs> Badly right now, to be honest. Um, this is, this is something we need to fix. So this was something we were actually better at when we launched that I, has slipped out of practice. I don't even know why. So we used to use Trello. And Deanna at the time, I'm not saying she lost the skills, but Trello might have changed, was a Trello expert, especially with using Butler bots or something. I She was the expert, not me. <laughs> but she was able to use these like Butlers, which are bots in Trello to have it like pop up with what you had to do each day. And then you drag things to different columns and it reminded us what to tweet and what to share and everything else. That just fell by the wayside. Um, part of it being because we fell behind on a couple things. I was getting really annoyed by all the notices coming up for stuff I hadn't done yet. Um, plus it was extra work. Like it, there was, once you use Trello, be, once you start using a formal schedule, update the schedule has to go on the schedule somehow. Right. So that ended up becoming more work and we got to a certain cadence where we just did the same thing every week. So it just worked. Um, that was going pretty good until we started doing two reviews and then it took a bit to sit down and reschedule. So right now, what I actually have is a notepad file, literally in windows notepad that lists three different schedules. One is what's going up on YouTube. The next is what's going up on the blog. And the third is what I need to promote. And it's working, but what I'm not doing, which is hurting us in the long term, is I'm not re-promoting things. So at this point, if you follow me on social media, one notice, out a new thing. That's it. And that's actually bad for social media. I should be then three days later saying, hey, in case you missed it. And then one month later being like, hey, a month ago we... And then three months later going, hey, did you catch this out from last quarter and so on. Now, Deanna is the expert on that and how often you should do that and where and on what platforms. And I, she does that professionally, right? So we should be doing more of that and we're not. And we need to find a way to get back to that. So that's probably going to mean starting up Trello again. But it might mean something else. I don't know. Yeah, I've, uh, I've experimented. I was using Microsoft To Do for a while. Um, because it had a real handy copy and paste. And the, the main thing I was using it for, uh, was pre-show because earlier on, before I automated a lot of things, there were like, you know, 32 steps of things I needed to go through before the show on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And if we missed one of them, uh, things got all out of whack and, you know, streams didn't work and audio wasn't ready and, and there were a world of problems. So that was how I got started on using, the scheduling system right. was just that one thing on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we started breaking out more um, into the uh, various other components, um, you know, the, for the, for the podcast, it's easy. It always comes out Tuesday at 2 AM. Mm -hmm. So I've always got from whenever we finish on Wednesday until Tuesday to get it out. Uh, and then, uh, but then we started doing all this YouTube stuff and that's where things got a little bit more complex mm -hmm. because we've got to break them up. And then there was the express that had to get done and we needed to make sure, okay, you've got to have it recorded by whatever mm -hmm. time on Friday so that I can have time to get it all around and, and, and prep. Uh, so for a while I was actually using a whiteboard, um, with all the re YouTube release dates and I would write in what show, what episodes or what segments or what unboxings were going to get released on given days. Um, just so that I could look at that, look up at the whiteboard and go, Oh, it's Wednesday today. I need to have this ready and this ready. And mm -hmm. I would just cross things off once I got them uploaded and let you know. But, um, we're, at, we're at a stable rhythm right now where I, I just kind of fall into it. I know yeah. that Thursday night, I'm going to do that or, you know, Wednesday night, I'm going to do this Thursday morning. I'm going to do this Friday. I'm going to do this. And then I'm pretty much good again until, uh, 
the podcast. See, I'm still having a hard time scheduling the writing of the stuff. So trying to figure out, and I, I don't know an answer to this, when to put out the content on the blog versus the YouTube and when to even write it to have it ready. So what I've been doing now is we decided before I was always writing the review and then we would have the podcast and I basically read off the review and I've switched that so that now we, the first time you hear us talk about a game is here on the live show. And that's to encourage people to join us here on the live show. And I think it's worth doing. If you want the, you want the, 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 from, from the horse's mouth, like if you want the original, you want to know my first thoughts on the Shadowrun beginner box, the only place you're going to hear that is here tonight. You're going to hear my first thoughts on the Shadowrun beginner box. Now we did cheat this week. Quad Heroes is already live, but that was just so we put out some content last week when I was off for a week. But normally you wouldn't hear about Quad Heroes until the show came out. So we switched it so that I'm not publishing that stuff until after we talked about it here. So now I have to, and, and then the YouTube versions come out and we decided the YouTube versions are going to come out Fridays and Sundays. So I decided to put them out on the blog the day before. And the reason is anyone watching on social media is going to get confused. Like I I've seen it happen. I've seen people reply if I put them out on the same day, because I'll be like, Hey, quad heroes review up on YouTube. And then five hours later, I'm like, Hey, quad heroes review back on the blog. And everyone's like, yeah, I already saw your quad heroes review. Why would I click through? Right. Where technically they're two separate pieces of content right. consumed possibly by different people or people might want to read both. So I decided to release them the day before. So you always see it a day ahead of time on the blog. And then the YouTube version comes out the next day, but it's different with the ask the bell hop. The ask the bell hop now comes out on Saturday and I've started putting it out on the blog on Sunday. Right. But just because that was a day I wasn't putting out anything else, right? So I still, that still may change for when that stuff comes out and gets written and whatever. Just because, like I said, I don't want to promote the exact same content on two different platforms on the same day. Because people are going to think they're the same content when they're right. not. So the, the short answer to Louis Martinez is, how do you manage your schedule? Very badly. <laughs> yeah. No, it is. Right now it is. That, that Deanna is saying, we put way too much thought into this stuff. Maybe we do. Yeah. Like, like, I know this is the thing we, we do way more work than a lot of other podcasters. And I'm not saying this is a good thing, but like, there are so many podcasters who just like sit down every Thursday and turn on their mics and go. Mm -hmm. And like, that's it. Right. Like maybe they, like, like even our show notes are excessive compared to some people. Right. Like I, I was on onboard games and I'm like, so you guys have show notes. They're like, Oh no. And yeah. we're sitting before the show started going, well, what should the topic for today be? And I'm like, seriously? Like, you guys are on the episode, like, 340 something. And they're like, yeah, we've done it so long. We know what we're doing. I'm yep. like, all right, fair enough. Like, there's a lot of people that just sit down and do it, right? And I will say, our life would be so much easier if we only did one of the things, right? Like, yeah. when, when we do a review, we're talking about it here. There's a YouTube version. There's a blog version. There's also the weekend reviews we talk about for weeks leading up to the review. Like, most people their review will be a 10 minute segment, of their podcast along with everything else, right? Yep. Like we definitely give a lot more focus, which is why I don't know if people have noticed it, but in the last year I've switched to calling them detailed reviews. I always say we'll have two detailed reviews this episode because I'm also going to talk about other games, which are technically reviews, right? When I talk about our weekend review and I'm talking about how my game of Jaws of the Lion went last Sunday, that's just as valid as my detailed review telling you what's in the box. Yep. Okay. But yeah, we schedule badly. We're we're working on it. <laughs> Deanna and I keep talking about we have to get, like I said, Trello or something, something more, something I can refer back to, and then look into software for scheduling for the social. Because I spend a lot of time tweeting, posting, copying, pasting onto various social media sites. And if I could switch that to whether it's using something like Buffer or if this, then that. So that I put it in one spot and then it just goes and I don't have to worry about it. Unfortunately, if this, then that is, has been so unreliable over the years, yeah, it's... Uh, you know, you really need to kind of think about, do you, do you want something that you're going to put all your rely on to and then all of it, you know, all your reliance into for mm. it to just go wrong and all of a sudden it starts spamming people or something. Yeah. Because uh, we've seen that happen with if this, then that. For that. Yes. Though so if this, then that, it's not their fault as much as the, the social media sites changing their yeah, API. No, absolutely. There, there, it's it's a not lot of them different... keeping up. It's yeah. that like Instagram doesn't tell anyone they're about to change their API yeah, and then just there, does yeah, and everything no, breaks. No blame. It's just that's yeah. you know, what happened <laughs> basically. Like I said, our, our best bet's probably something like Buffer is one of the, the well-known ones, which I uh, guess you have to pay for, but I think we have a copy through AppSumo. So I think we have a lifetime copy of that. 
there's a tip, right? All right. So we were talking about things that people could ask. And I know one specifically asked this, but if you want something we've learned in two years, subscribe to AppSumo. This is a, a they they give various apps, plugins, WordPress plugins, software cheap, and often take things that are monthly subscriptions and offer them for one-time fees. Now, these one-time fees usually aren't cheap, but compared to paying forever are usually worth it. So there are a few things we've gotten through that. And I think D can probably drink, drop a link to AppSumo in the chat and we'll throw one in the show notes as well. So if you are thinking of being a content creator, now I'll admit, I get emails from them constantly. It's nothing I want 99% of the time. It's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. A lot of it's for online sales. If you have a web store, right. a lot of it's for that. But now and then you get this like awesome thing. One of the things we use it for is um, stock photos. We have credits at a number of stock photo sites bought through AppSumo. Not that I use a lot of stock photos in our in our our um, blog post. Ninety nine percent of it's my own photography, but there now and then a topic comes up, and I'm like, I don't know picture for this. Like, how do I get a picture for Angry Gamer? I don't have right. a picture of an Angry Gamer. Yeah. So we'll use stock photos for that. So yeah, AppSumo, we've gotten some great stuff. But like I said, most of it's at agency level. It's it's not stuff you need, but we have gotten good deals out of it. Excellent. All right. Well, we're going to move over to one of Ryan's questions. Came in from Fair. Twitter before the show. I think he was uh, stocking up so he didn't forget during the show. <laughs> Fair enough. Ryan asks, is there anything you've done or wanted to do with Tabletop Bellhop that you've had to abandon? Um, hmm. I got to think about this. I should have so, read the questions uh, the ahead easy, of time. The easy answer for me is Tabletop Express. Uh, the yeah. Bellhop or Bellhop Express. The Express show was something that we thought was going to uh, make a difference. It was that short, encapsulated uh, speed view of the week uh, that would give people uh, an inter an engaging sort of uh, newsroom style uh, show about what was going on in that twenty minute timeline that you know YouTube seems to like for advertising purposes and all sorts of things, uh, and it failed. Uh, nobody watched yeah. it. Uh, I mean, there were a couple of people who did, and thank you to those people. But unfortunately, for the amount of work we put into it, it failed. <laughs> See, I didn't actually list that because that wasn't something we wanted to do that failed. We decided to, like, I don't know. Well, like, we didn't start going, we we're going to do this. Do. Yeah, so, okay. Fair I don't enough. know what you might have wanted to do that you've had to abandon, but uh, but that was something we've done that we wanted to yeah. admit, that uh, we'd ended up no one know what we should do and i haven't done that is go to youtube now and see if any of those are having views now if they they had long-term stay i doubt it not they likely, definitely weren't yeah. at the time yeah I don't, that seemed like it would be a good format yeah um, it, it, it fit it fit all the it, it fit into the uh sort of the box of what you're supposed to put out on youtube for yeah non-gaming <laughs> content obviously yeah gaming content i guess people don't um our original, some of our, our, our insert buildings we had to give away. The the one thing we still haven't done, I don't know if we've abandoned it yet, but we're close, is going to two cameras. But the thing is, I think we need something better than these laptop to get there for downstairs. Unbelievable. Up here, I keep meaning to do it. Um, again, I haven't abandoned it, though, so there we might do it. Um, I definitely want the top-down camera. At some point, we got to figure that out with a yep. blue screen. Yep. And I hear a blue screen's better than a green screen because most board games have green components and not as many blue. Right. So supposedly blue screen is better. That's something. But again, we haven't abandoned it. Um, there's a good one, Deanna's pointing out. Our Patreon, we definitely haven't found the right reward levels. Like right. we, we came up with all these, these great higher tier rewards that we thought people would be interested in that are way cheaper than, say, hiring a consultant. But seems no one's interested in those concierge <laughs> services. Right. So we might need to retweak it. Now, I will admit, we did great at up to the the hotel guest level like that worked really well like what we did to revise it up to that point was good uh we do have one awesome patron who is taking advantage of the um chair at the table level which is great which speaking of which we owe him some games hopefully john's feeling better from his slip and fall indeed yeah but yeah our patreon definitely didn't go as well as we'd hoped though again i don't think we've had to abandon it but we might just we might as well abandon those higher level tiers that aren't getting any interest so I just took a quick look over on YouTube and for the express videos, the blue plate special, which was the one that we forced people to watch, yeah, uh, has, 160, has 116 views. Uh, yeah. And then it drops down to 60 as the next best all the way down to 16. 
So yeah, so like sixteen, like yeah. that's terrible. Part of it too is like, how do you come up with a good title? We talk yeah. about too much. It's not concise in the knowledge that's in each one. So yeah. like that's part of the problem on YouTube is that um you have to like to promote it for SEO purposes. What the heck do I put in a title to encompass three reviews and all the games I played in the last week and discussing best six player games, right? Like because yeah. that's what we did in the Express is we put all of it in one. Yeah, no, that was a tough one. Um, coffee, I've basically given up on. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of things I tried to do for money we've basically given up on. I, I can't think of anything we really wanted to do we didn't do, though. Yeah, no, we've... we've no, what much... didn't work is any of our live streams. Like, our big live streams did nothing. Like, our Extra Life live streams. Yeah, no, we, we, we haven't had luck with our with our parties or our extra life live streams or the various uh, times we've tried to just, you know, get a camera and get people interacting with uh, the games we play and the places we play and, uh, and and get a little, you know, interaction on that more personal level. That's that's mm -hmm. not us talking to you, but sort of inviting you into the games with us. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to allude to. Like, like we'll stream 24 hours for Extra Life because it's Extra Life and it's a 24-hour event. But, like, no one really watched that. We had a couple people join in. Even more so was, um, like, we did our New Year's party the one year and we streamed that. Yep. Like, it just, I thought people would care and no one seemed to care, <laughs> which is fire. Yep. But I actually thought, I see other people doing that and I see big crowds. And another thing, here's something else. This is interaction with the chat during actual plays. We haven't right. found a good way to get that to work. Like, I thought there would be more... Because we never figure how to get donations like uh, Critical Role and all those do it right where you you can like whatever donate five bucks to give someone a reroll or to change the plot. We kind of gave up on that like that never really took off. We never really figured out how to do it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so let's see here. Um, I'm going to jump back. We have another question from William J. Brown to the third that, that's similar to that. And what has been the best change you have made to the product you produce? I think splitting out the YouTube videos, Take, taking the full show and cutting it into segments, I think is the, is the best thing we've done. Though, I don't know, you look at the numbers and I, I wonder sometimes. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely up there. I think the rearranging of the, the show order. Yeah, that's a good is, one. Is it may, maybe, you know, it's, it's right up there. It's, it's, it's a close call. They both had some pretty serious impact, I think. But, uh, you know, when we, when we brought the ask up to the front and pushed the reviews and the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the week in the review to the back, um, I feel like that was a significant change that just kind of feels better for the flow of the show. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Though it does always, I always wonder if people just tune out after we finish this segment. <laughs> it sometimes feels that way. Though I have had, but three people now write that they hate the first half of our show. So fair enough. There we they go. don't, that we spend too much time interacting with you people in the chat. Sorry. Yeah. Though I don't care as long as they keep listening. If they jump an hour ahead, that's fine. They're still <laughs> Absolutely. listening. Absolutely. Right, they're still fair. If you yeah. dig my opinions on games, that's cool. Um, I, I, that's probably the best one. I think the unboxing videos have gotten way better compared to when I sat back in a chair and kind of held stuff up. Yeah, we've, we've we're definitely getting there. It's, I mean, we still like need, they, they get more hits and stuff. We still they need seem more, to do better. Uh, but it's it's definitely getting there. Um, and what I think I need to do for the unboxings is switch downstairs. I need to be downstairs with but, the game. But I'm not. Going I'm, behind. I'm telling you, you're not allowed to go downstairs until you get lighting. So yeah. <laughs> there's, there's your, when, when we get the lights down to you, yeah, when we get the um, lights, well, we can move downstairs because the, the table space is definitely a yeah. major benefit. Um, I know. You Plus then I can do struggle. the two cameras and I should be able to do the top, the top down. Yeah. Right. Like, like yeah. I think that's the next step. I know, I know you struggle with, with the amount of space available on yeah. that desk. Uh, yes. <laughs> and that's a huge thing. You know, you look at a lot of these unboxings and they've got a dedicated table. Yeah. They've um, opened up the whole thing. They've, they've got a game table. Yeah. But uh, but it's too dark down there to do it right, really. Like, to show off the components properly, mm -hmm. you need the light. Well, that's right. I think you also need the drop down, right? Because I'm going to have the camera further away. I won't be able to hold stuff up, right? right. I, yep. Whereas if I can hold it off to the, the drop down camera. Um, I don't know. There isn't, we haven't changed our overall product that much in two years. No, yeah. Have you like, made? Like, have you done anything notably different on the blog? I mean, you just redesigned just the, the order. Blog. Well, yeah, we just uh, with the, the, that. That's a big change. Our branding, working with RPG and Co. So we're true. working with Brian Vice with uh, PlayRPGandCo.com. 
awesome t-shirts. He's got some really nice dragons he's now done yep. for the different dragons. He's got a Beholder shirt that I really want a copy of. Uh, he also has done design work now for uh, Tabletop Renaissance, which is uh, Windsor's newest local game store. And there's someone else I'm trying to remember. I got him. I hooked up with him, someone who was a new podcaster. And I'm okay. forgetting at the time. Um, the the uh, But the new look. Right. And what we just did a huge update on the blog to our mobile site. We look so much better in mobile now. Little things about centering images, where our sidebar shows up. There were some definite advantages. Um, like even Deanna's admitting it now. She's like Gutenberg blocks for the win. Which is something well, I you know never what? thought I would hear Dee yeah. say because Gutenberg was the bane of her existence when it first yep. appeared. I, it really is better, right? Like yep. it took a while for her to learn it. I <laughs> still don't. I still I still use classic editor on uh, right. WordPress for all my blog posts. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't had, had to work in a, uh, I, I, I started dabbling in Gutenberg for a little bit in one blog that I was contributing some stuff to, but I, I just kind of, I walked away from that. And so I haven't, I st I'm still a classic editor person because I, I knew I was playing with them and I saw something, mm -hmm. but I just didn't have the time to, uh, to jump in and do anything with it. So yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Like our rebranding, the the layout of the blog is definitely better. The addition, I don't know how many people listen to it this way, but the when we got Aaron, Aaron is our webmaster. The awesome Aaron Lynn is our webmaster who helps us get all this stuff done. Now, Deanna does a lot of it herself, but Aaron's the the pro that gets us to that next level. When we added the the bar at the top where you can listen to our podcast, no matter what page you're on on the blog, I think was a big one. Uh, we added advertisements. I I don't know about that being the best change we've made, but it does <laughs> help pay the bills significantly. Yeah. I, it has made a big difference in our ability to continue doing the show. I do hate the fact that our blog's filled with ads, but we have now learned how to manage where they show up, which has made a huge difference. Right. Uh, for example, our our Gen Con sale page, uh, which I sent a link out to our in our newsletter. There's still like sales out there. Was showing an ad every item. Like Oof. it would show a shop, then an ad, a shop, then an ad. I counted 52 ads on the page the first time. I'm like, my God, what are you doing to me? But we now know how right. to do it. So we can we 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 don't specify where the ad show up, but we put breaks. So hey, Mediavine, if you want to throw an ad here, you can. Is right. what we do now. So I do apologize for the ads, but you know what? They're making a huge difference in our ability to keep doing this. And, and that's pretty important, for especially yeah. for all you people who actually like listening to us. Uh, let's see here. What else have we got? Um, uh, we got a quick and easy question here from Tech in the chat room. Any new hardware for the show, or is it just still the light sitting at Sean's? Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the light still sitting at Sean's. Oh, you almost lost a bit there. It's yeah, just... no, no new hardware. I went shopping for a new webcam. I was going to buy a 4K webcam, but I didn't realize that COVID made webcams scarce. Yeah, no webcams, so in, that webcams didn't happen. In, in pandemic times are not. Workable. Yeah, which I, I had no clue, but I guess it makes sense. So no, no, no actual new hardware. We have new games to review, but that's not hardware. <laughs> uh, no, no, no changes. Plans, yes. Sean's got lights. I do want to get a new because what I want to do is I want to switch this to a 4K and then use that for the drop down. Right. That's the plan. Cause I need a new one for the drop down either way. Yeah. And I'm thinking 4k is probably better for the wide view. Whereas you don't need. Well, 4K I mean, if we could just get close. the camera that you've got there, well, hooked the up? camera works. The problem is it doesn't yeah. work on these laptops. She doesn't I have know. the USB port. Yeah. The camera works fine. Now I finally got it to work. It had to do with the ports, yeah. but I, that the, that's possibly the other thing that's on the list to buy is a PC for downstairs. Instead of the laptop, I had dedicated PC for streaming. Yeah put it downstairs and then we start broadcasting from downstairs instead of up here. And it goes somewhere under the, like probably in the curve of the, like the, the table legs on my thing are big round semicircles. Yeah, yeah. So kind of nested under there. I don't know. That, that, that's a long-term plan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've got a question here that came in from hungry gamer. I've made the jump and started an Instagram for hungry gamer. Tips and tricks to make it useful? I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm definitely on the no clue uh, side of that one. So I will let you speak on how the heck you do Instagram. All right. So we do pretty good on Instagram. We're not great. We're not blowing anyone away. But our average post hits over 100 hearts, likes, whatever. And I have almost 5,000 followers. So at, I, compared to other gamers I see, there are people doing better. But there are a lot doing worse. So... Some of the tips are post every day, 
put up one pitcher every day. Um, make sure it's a good pitcher. Don't just necessarily throw from your camera. Instagram includes um, a ton of photo editing built-in software that's actually really solid for adjusting your brightness, your focus. You can even in do the whole um, make only one thing and focus, everything else blurry, all that fun stuff. Use those. Don't just necessarily post straight up from your camera. Um, the other one is hashtags. So place once a day at least, possibly twice a day, and you want to include a ton of hashtags Right now, I think it's 30 per post is the recommended. Yeah, that's the this thing. Is why I don't do Instagram. Yeah. This right here, this description that Mo is going through is why I don't Instagram. That's This <laughs> is the worst part about Instagram. You want to you include like 30 hashtags every post. Uh, right now, I couldn't tell you what's better, but it switches between put them in the post and put them in the first comment. Yeah, so in Instagram is very SEO-ish. Yeah, so the, the tags are important. Hashtags are huge. That's how most people are going to find you. Right now, it's actually people are recommending you put them in the post itself, not the comments. I continue to just put them in the comments because I'm lazy. But what I have, and this is my pro tip, is I have a notepad file, and I have a similar one on my phone where I have listed board game. And then I have, uh, I, was it hashtag or pound? I always want to say pound because that's what I know it as. But has, tag game night, tag board games, tag board game, tag board gaming, tag gaming, tag BGG, tag board game geek, tag tabletop, tag tabletop gaming, tag analog gaming, tag games of Instagram, tag Insta games, tag gamestagram, tag play board games, tag board game addict, tag play board games, tag board game life and tag oh i have gaming twice see i should fix that that goes on every post i put then if it's a certain type of game i will add other ones so let's say it's an escape room then i add tag puzzle tag escape room tag escape room in a box tag puzzle game or if it was a review it would say tag review tag board game review tag game review tag tabletop game review and so on so what i do is i copy paste the appropriate tags for whatever I'm talking about. And then the other thing is you shouldn't do quite what I'm doing. You should swap them up. So you should have a couple different sets that you use and switch between them. The biggest thing though is post every day, like try to be consistent and post once or twice every day and you'll start doing it. Now, the other thing is interact with people. When someone you likes your thing, click on theirs and go like a few other things and reciprocate basically. So this is something we like to do while we're watching Netflix or whatever. We'll go downstairs while we'll Netflix on, you open up Instagram, you go look and go, Oh, this person liked my post. Let's click on them. Yep. Good. It's all board gaming. And all you do is double tap to like, and you just scroll up, double tap, double tap, double tap, double tap, double tap. Now I personally don't spam it that much. I actually click on pictures. I like, like I'm not just doing it to get the likes back. I'm like, Oh, that was cool. That was cool. That's your kid. I'm not going to like that. No offense. I don't mind your kids, but I'm on instagram for gaming and so on oh look you made a cute custard pie i don't care my other account i might like that <laughs> one um so basically you're gonna keep doing that right you're gonna you're gonna sit there and like back people who like your stuff what i will purposely do is find people who don't follow me and i'll like a bunch of their stuff and hopes they'll follow me right. uh, that's pretty much it so yes uh, as deanna says thank you for attending our mini blogger conference <laughs> Well, we did say it. That's what we learned in the yep. last two years. No, That's absolutely. what we were looking for tonight. We talked about the best two-player action games with too many dice every other week. So this was the chance to talk about something else. Yep. All right. So we're going to jump into a question here from Ryan again. Uh, <clears throat> is there anything you still have plans to do that you have yet to do? I not except for just upgrade our quality right like to all kinds of quality like i said i want i kind of want to get a new pc downstairs i would like to build more of a studio um possibly get a green screen if we keep doing up here so we can hide that closet mainly that's <laughs> that's the biggest one we'd want a green screen for um no i'm getting review copies pretty regularly now that was a big goal and that's happening um part of it is the, the one thing that hasn't happened again this goes into making this viable is what i would like to do is have a way to sell off the review copies of games that i don't feel need to stay in my collection so th that also goes with i really want to call my collection down it's at the point besides just not having enough room there's so many games downstairs that i haven't played in so long it's just not worth keeping these games and 
I think one of the ways to make this value the viable is what people do in the tech industry. So people in the tech industry get review copies for free, similar to what we do, but then they can sell the tech and they can sell it for good money. Board games don't necessarily sell for good money, but it is a way to increase the revenue stream of this. So when you get a review copy of a game and I play it and I enjoy it, like check out our review of Jaws from last week for a perfect example of a game that I think is a great game, just not one I feel the need to keep. It's other people are probably going to enjoy it more than I am. So what I would like to do is a way to get rid of my copy of Jaws to make a bit of money for it. Now, I'm not trying to profit off the review copies that come to me. That's not the point. I've done the work. I've done a review. I've, I've done held up my end of the bargain. There's no reason I should have to keep the game forever, in my opinion. And I would like to be able to have that as a revenue stream. Now, we were going to be working with one of the local game stores to do this, who were supposed to launch uh, commission sales. But that fell through with COVID. Well, I don't. I shouldn't say fell through, but it, it never happened. <laughs> yeah, it never yeah. took off because COVID hit. I don't know. I don't know. You have anything for that? Uh, no, I have to say, I, you know, I really, realistically, I mean, there's there's things I would love to to do, but most of them involve you know technical upgrades and trying to improve our content so that it can look and sound the best it can for the audience, uh, you know, cause the, the better we look and sound, the more people are, are willing to, to listen to things is, is generally what you find. So, you know, quality improvements. Uh, another question from Ryan, cause our chat room's a little, uh, soft on <laughs> questions today. Uh, if you were asked to join a board game content creation network, would you accept? It depends what that entitled <laughs> depends what they would want as part of a board game content creation network. Like if it was just something like an old uh, web ring, like back in the day where you all just promoted each other. Sure. Uh, if it was something where I started writing content for other people, there would have to be some kind of compensation provided. Um, I, I, like I said, it depends what you'd have for a great board game content creation. Network. Like for example, we talked about trying to get into the dice tower and we were kind of like, why? Like in, in a way, um, for one, we'd have to watch our P's and Q's a little more than we do now. And I, fair enough, I guess we could try to do better at that. But I enjoy our after show where I don't have to worry about that. We'd have to drop that segment of our show. Um, plus, I don't what does it get us, right? Maybe a whole bunch more people find us and we start doing better. But again, what's the end result? We get a few more listeners. We get a few more viewers. I don't know. Right. Plus, then then we're tied into that brand. And some there are things some people don't like about that brand where I'd rather be judged on our own merits. Yeah. Um, no. And the, the other one of the other issues you get into is when you get into things like the web rings and, and you know, sell mutual promotion things. Uh, we have spent a lot of time and money and effort building our brand to where it is right now. Mm -hmm. And unless we were moving into a group who were already at a similar point and we were just looking to share our experiences between similar levels, that would be fine. But we don't want to exist as, you know, we've got, a, you know, a thousand listeners, for instance, and we're getting invited to a group who they all have a couple hundred listeners. Um, that's, you know, there, there's some, you need some balance, right? And you need, you need, you don't want to, you don't want to be uh, letting other people ride on your back or riding on other people's backs completely. Yeah. Uh, you know. Fair enough. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, it, like I said, it would depend what they had to offer. Yeah. I, there are enough out there. At one time we were, when we launched this, we were supposed to be part of the misdirected Martin network. And I honestly still don't quite understand what happened there. We launched without them or something. I don't. I don't quite we, know. We did how that too failed. much. We did too much work on our own. Yeah, uh, ahead and, of time, and, I and guess. established a brand that was separate from Misdirected Mark rather yeah. than being part of Misdirected Mark. Is I Which think the only thing, the only like I, I'm not saying that it, we might have got more audience out of it, but not counting that. The only advantage I think we go to that is we'd have Rob Abrazado as an editor, which would be kind of nice, <laughs> like a pro <laughs> editor that does all the stuff in the background, yeah. and we just send them off the stuff and like here you go, have our audio. <laughs> Like that, I think that's the only thing we lose out on, I, in my opinion, for not being part of that network. And they very much switched to more of an RPG network than they were before. Yeah, and then they, they have definitely branched out in a different direction than what we have. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. Again with Ryan here. This is the, the Ryan Q&A show. Ryan Q&A show. Is there anything that would cause you to stop doing the live show? I don't know. I'm not... 
not nothing I can think of like illness like last week like if there's some technical breakdown but I don't see why not I don't get why we wouldn't right yeah. like it's it's one of those like people have asked why do you do unboxing videos they don't get a lot of hits and they don't I'll admit it we are unboxings don't get a ton every now and then one will take off but I gotta open it anyway right like i gotta open this box anyway why not show off what's in there while i'm doing it yep. and the same thing we got to record this podcast anyway and by doing it live we get the interaction like tonight's a bad example because we're doing an ama but on our normal show it's the interaction we have with the chat every time we have our ask the bell hop we stop in at the chat room at the end and 99.9 percent .9 of the time if we're doing board game recommendations someone's got games we forgot or if we are talking about suggestions on how to get rid of games there'll be something someone says in the chat that adds to that conversation and we wouldn't get that if it was just sean and i recording not with video on skype on a tuesday morning or whatever and i would miss that interaction that's one of my favorite parts about our show is the amount we do interact with with you awesome people who are listening yeah it's interesting because i had never considered this video was not part of the original <laughs> pitch i made uh not in the least but uh i have come to enjoy this interaction with the uh, the video i could take or leave but the interaction with the chat room uh, yeah. has really been a major part of it. So I think uh, even if something, you know, if Twitch went belly up, you know, Amazon somehow yeah. died or something, uh, you know, there's YouTube. We can go to YouTube. We could go, I'd rather not, but we could go to Facebook Live. Or, you know, there are other options yeah. out there um, for streaming that we would just switch to. I mean, we could pivot, we could pivot to YouTube Live in a week easily. Yeah. If, if Twitch went down today, uh, tomorrow morning, I think next Wednesday I could have us up and running on YouTube mm -hmm. live without missing a beat. So, yeah, I would say the only thing that would stop us doing the live show is if we stopped doing the show altogether. Yeah. Like if for whatever reason, like if, if it, for one thing, if this note was no longer financially viable, we may not be able to keep doing it. If, if I had to go get a real job, quote right. unquote, I personally think this is a real job, but there's people out there that don't like banks for one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if I happen to get a real job and I no longer have the time to do that, though, I have a feeling even if that happened, it would become more of a chit chat show with less scripting and uh, we'd only do one review a week and I, I'd probably still do it because I'd like doing it. I enjoy, I enjoy talking about games or else we wouldn't be here talking about games. <laughs> I would probably still figure something out. The blog would probably cut down to like maybe one blog post or whatever, but right. Especially since we weren't actually, uh, you know, relying on it as the income at that point, uh, there wouldn't be as much need to put the entire life and times into it and uh, dedicate our lives to, or your lives especially, to, to yeah. generating the content. Yeah, like Deanna says, we put in probably 60 hours a week each to, to not just to do this live show, but everything, right? The unboxings, the videos, the the blog, the, blog, the deals, the sale pages, the newsletters, all of the stuff. So it's a lot more work than a lot of people think. Yeah, and I mean, like, I don't, and I don't put in anywhere near the amount of time you guys do, because again, I do have a yeah. full-time job, but... Uh, you know, it's it, you know it takes me an hour or so to make sure I've gone through the the script and make sure my act aspects of that are good. Um, now tonight after the show, we'll if we go off the air around midnight most weeks. Uh, I'm usually up until about three a.m. doing the intro edits, mm -hmm. uh, and then tomorrow morning I get up and while I'm doing my paid job, I will be uploading our YouTube videos and starting to do the edits on our first of the reviews. Uh, and then usually Friday morning at some point, I will sit down and do the second review. Uh, so mm. you're looking at just with the video editing and uploading times, uh, you know, three, three hours, maybe four hours, depending on how much uh, editing needs to go into the reviews. Uh, and then a whole ton of uh, the actual upload times. But I, that's, yeah, that's, but that's basically you're, wasted. You're not I mean, busy not, during those times. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the audio podcast, uh, a lot of it depends on the episode. Some episodes mm -hmm. are really easy. I can do the edit and be done the whole thing in, you know, and have it ready in two hours. Uh, I just usually wait three days because I'm lazy and never record those little bumpers I do at the beginning and the end until like Sunday morning or Sunday night. Uh, and then upload that, throw the information in after uh, Mo and D have gone through and done all the show notes. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I'm still... My, you know, on a good week, I'm still doing six to eight hours of editing video and uh, audio. And Mo's coughing a little bit, but uh, we got a question here from 
Uh, CH2674. Oh, it's tech. I just didn't oh, copy tech. it off. We got a question from tech in our chat room. So, <laughs> when we can get out a little more, what is the first thing both of you would want to do? Uh, I'm going for some Windsor pizza. I need some Windsor. Actually, you know what? I wouldn't even go out. I just go to Windsor Pizza, the place Windsor Pizza, buy a damn Panzerati and bring it home. I haven't had a Panzerati since March. That's just wrong. That's completely wrong. I haven't had a Windsor Panzerati in way too long. Uh, I want to get down to Windsor and, and game. <laughs> I just yeah. want. To, I just want to get down and get get down and, and, and play some board games, uh, as well as deliver some light. But yeah. you know, really, just get some board gaming in because uh, there really isn't much happening up here with me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. See, I like. I yeah. I, I'm. I am looking forward to getting back to local events, be hosting game nights. I'm hosting game nights, getting to meet gamers, hanging out with friends, people like tech, and um, getting to play games. Right. So I'm falling behind on reviews because I don't have the time to play all the games. Well, I have the time, but I don't have the people. Right. Whereas if I was playing regularly, I'm certain we would have played Break Dancing Meeple and uh, Laser Chess. Sorry, it's not called Laser Chess. Roll for Lasers and probably that Animal Kingdom game because they're all quick, fast paced kind of games that I would bring them out to something like an easy mode event or a CG Realm event and stuff like that. So, yeah, de definitely going out to the games, getting Gloomhaven started again with Tori and Cat. I miss hanging out with Tori and Cat. Though, like I said, that, that's the game you're like. Most likely, though, like go for a Panzerati. Go to the Sandwich Brewing Company on a double date with Tori and Kat because we have such a good time doing that. They have great beer. Have some good beers. Have a huge charcuterie board that we didn't have to make and cut ourselves <laughs> um, and play some light games, right? Like I could totally see sitting with Kat and Tori having some beers playing Breakdancing Meeple, right? Like I look forward to seeing them. Um, I would want to have like, like we still haven't had our gaming in the New Year's party. So maybe have that <laughs> like the, the mid-year, the, the COVID's done. Yeah. gaming party where we we're up till three in the morning gaming playing in games. 2022 um yeah I, at this rate it might be <laughs> yeah i no, mean I, I miss the food i, yeah, my I life, used to eat out regularly my so. life hasn't changed as much as yours i mean i am a hermit i i yeah. i've got this really comfortable office that i spend a whole lot of time in uh and have since before the pandemic hit um but being able to to sort of go out freely yeah. um uh, <laughs> is would be nice uh i, 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 I Part of it for me, I, I love, he, he hates this about me. I love going shopping. I'm like, I miss just like walking around like a Toys R Us. Like I go to Toys R Us just to walk around and look at the cool toys. And like, well, every now and then I want to buy stuff for the kids. But most of the time I don't even buy anything. Like I, I, I actually do miss that. Like I didn't, I didn't hang out at the mall. I was never one for going to the mall. But like toy stores, masterminds, stuff like that. Yep. Even just browsing CG to see what they have, right? What games they have, what new model kits. They got really into Gundam, I think, now the, since they used to. That's, that's a big thing there. I do. I, I miss that. Yeah, and Deanna saying our budget really likes that you aren't going <laughs> shopping. No, it's true. Like I, I like shopping. I always have. I don't know. I got it from my mom. My dad hated it. Like we, we go to the states. And my dad would go and he'd find whatever food court there was at whatever place we were at, and would sit down in that food court for the whole time. And my mom would go shop for hours. I'd be, I'd want to be with my mom until she started shopping for clothes. I hate shopping for clothes. That's yeah. even for myself. I just hate <laughs> shopping for clothes. But anything else, I'd, I'd hit every bookstore, every you know CD music shop, every video game place anywhere that happened to have anything board gaming related i, yeah. I do miss physically shopping but that's yeah, not definitely not first it's interesting since the since the pandemic i have put gas in the van once yeah us <laughs> too literally once i filled up once yeah or maybe it's twice it might have been twice because we have gone out to the county a couple times right because there's some things we can only pick up out there yeah, yeah. But yeah all right we're at 10 30 i don't know if we can do one more or if you just want to call it uh, I think at this uh, point, we've hit a bunch of different yeah. topics at this point. I think Ryan, we, we missed a couple of years, Ryan, but uh, we'll, we'll throw them in there for later. <laughs> if there's something you really want us to answer, we can do, but I think we got most of the big ones uh, here. What would it need to happen for us to do a show dedicated to RPG content? I would need to start playing RPGs again. I would feel bad doing an RPG show. I think I could pull it off. I played enough RPGs in my life. Like we're going to have some RPG content later in the show tonight. And I think I can still talk with authority about RPGs, but it has been so long since I've actually sat down and played one. I would feel like I'm, I'm like lying to people, not showing my geek cred to, to be talking about role-playing games and DM tips all week when I haven't played a game in three years. Like it would just feel weird. And I have played, I played at cons, but I haven't run a game in a dang long time. Yeah. Now for patrons, I am still hoping to run something. I was hoping by next week. I don't know if that's going to happen. So I am hoping to try some role-playing. We might 
might do something soon. So that is something. But RPG only content. See, the thing is, like, we're not supposed to be board game content now. We're not supposed to be role playing content now. We're supposed to be tabletop content. And I think I prefer to stick to that. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people would prefer if we split into two shows where we'd have RPG shows and board game shows. What I am hoping to do is increase the amount of RPG content we have because I have RPG content to review. And Sean even has something he wants to review. So what we are hoping to do is to not do 50-50, but one review a week for the next month or so, possibly two months, is going to be RPG content. And I said, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people would prefer if we split this off. But if you listen to us on YouTube, you can just get the RPG content. Yeah. Right, that's part of the advantage of us splitting out the the game room segment of the show, is that you could just consume that RPG content. Yep. All right. Well, that's it for this week's two year anniversary AMA. Next week we get back to answering questions sitting from fans with the topic Roger Malosh asking about Power Creek and growing gamer experience. Power creep. And creek, growing gamer yes. experience, I'm guessing. Is the that's Power Creek. <laughs> Power Creek. That, that's me, me not being able to type. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Gaming Advice at the top of the page. Uh, finally, if you've got a gaming or game night question for us, now we want actual gaming content, actual gaming questions, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or just email us directly questions at tabletopbellhop.com up next a look at quad heroes a modular scenario based adventure board game with a neat mechanic please note the designer and publisher of quad heroes provided us with a review copy of the game no other compensation was provided uh quad heroes was developed by fellow canadian ryan eiler and self-published through his company wonderment games i uh, was successfully funded on kickstarter and published in 2019. now quad heroes is a modular scenario based adventure board game inspired by the gameplay of classic video games uh, it plays one to six players depending on the scenario and can be played cooperatively competitively in teams or one versus many depending on which scenario you play now, game length is extremely dependent on the scenario that's chosen, the number of players, and the amount of AP paralysis, paralysis during the game. I've finished game half an hour easily, but I've also had ones that take over two hours. Well, since Mo received a previous demo copy of this game, we don't have an unboxing video to show you. But you get a ton of stuff in this rather yeah. large box. 22 awesome looking hero miniatures two for each character skill tiles upgrade tiles and player boards for all these characters cube shaped sheep clear crystal miniatures custom d6 and d8 dice nine double-sided main boards four starting zone boards a round tracker a compass board and some moving platform board and over 200 tokens a main rule book and a scenario book, two drawstring bags, and some very cool custom bomb dice. Yeah, there is a ton of stuff in this box. There is so much stuff that the designer actually has like a how to baggy the stuff properly. Like it's insane. Now, <clears throat> because it's a scenario based game, how you actually play each scenario is going to be very different depending on which of the 25 included scenarios you play. But the basic mechanics are pretty much the same in all the scenarios. So each turn starts off with a chance to play cards, which I'll get into what the cards are about later. So you can play cards at the start of your turn that will affect your movement for the turn or do stuff on the board. Then the active player does the same. So the heroes are cubes, they're squares. And you are going to tumble it like a die. Like you're going to take it and tumble it to one orthogonally adjacent space. So you're going to, I don't know, tumble is the best word I can think of, but I, without being able to show you, I hope everyone knows what I mean. Roll, roll, uh, roll tumble, shift Yeah, roll, but not side. like a die. Like you're not going to okay. pick it up and roll it. Like it's, it's not fully random. You're, you're yeah. turning it to a side. Now, after you've tumbled, you're going to look at what side of the character is face up. And that determines how you move that turn. And so at the start of the game, you actually have all these movement skills. There's five different movement skills. You're going to assign them to five of the six sides of your die. I'm going to call them dice because they remind me of dice of your character. The movement types include uh, further tumbles, sliding orthogonally left and right, up and down, sliding diagonally, 
dashing, which goes in any direction, and jumping, which skips over spots. In addition to the five movement sides, each character has a side with a cue on it for the quad thing. Having the cue face up after you've tumbled has you use a special power, and each of the 11 different characters has a completely unique cue power. So, and this is that cool mechanic that I talked about at the very, mentioned at the very top, that is really part of what sets the game apart, forcing you to think about movement in a unique way. Yeah. And as well, you'll note that Mo mentioned in passing that juicy player asymmetry that we all yeah. love here at the Bellhops table. So someone in our chat room is pointing out, maybe flip. You're flipping it to another side, I guess is another way to do it. I said, once you see it, it tumbling makes perfect sense. So when moving... So you've already tumbled, you look at your top side, now you're gonna move. You're gonna interact with the board element. So you're here, you can do things like pick up objects, pick up sheep, drop sheep, pick up crystals. Um, there's a ton of board elements. You've got things like fast moving water that can push your character along, or there's whirlpools that can cause you to turn in place. There's pits you can fall into, teleporters, springs that bounce you around the board, walls that block movement and so on. There's all kinds of interactive board elements. Now, after moving, you then get one more chance to play cards, and then you enter what's called the exploration phase, and this is where you draft new cards. Now, I mentioned the cards a couple times. There are four types of cards. There are food cards that give you a bonus to movement, so they let you move further, or move in special ways. There are runes, which let you interact with the board, and these let you put out those board elements. Like, they'll let you put a teleporter out, or they'll let you uh, dig a tunnel, or they'll destroy a wall. There's pets and items. These are permanent upgrades that'll give you a new ability. And each character can only have one pet and one item equipped at a time. And then there were tools. These are single use and these are usually hugely, almost game breaking abilities. Like one of the tools lets you rotate a board 90 degrees while you're playing. Which again, builds out that asymmetry even further yeah. through the game, not at your, as player asymmetry. So then at the end of each month, the board elements activate. So certain things on the boards are going to keep going. So think Mario here. Bombs on the board are going to move a certain number of spaces every turn and keep going until they hit things. Cannons are going to generate new bombs. Sheeps wander, pits open, and so on. Now, I this depends completely on the scenario. So there's 25 different scenarios in the main thing. In the, in the main game. Then there's a thing where world events happen at the end. You flip it. This is going to cause something that happens that affects everyone. Some are good, some are bad. Finally, at the end of every round, you basically, I'm going to use an RPG term here, you level up your characters. Each character comes with a unique set of six upgrade tiles that are actually two-sided. And you're going to pick one tile on one side and put it onto your player board, and that is going to give you new things. Most of the abilities, like half the abilities, are going to give you more movement. So when you do move after you've tumbled, you're going to move further. But some also give new abilities. And the option, instead of unlocking more movement, is your ability to explore more cards. And again, exploring is drafting more of those card abilities that are going to let you move more, put on board elements. And now play just continues like this, round after round, until the game end condition specified in the scenario is met. Now, the scenarios really run a gamut. There are tons. There's your rally races, which remind me the most of Robo Rally, where you win by being the first person to hit a series of check marks on the board. Uh, there's PvP video game style ones where you're playing like Capture the Flag, where you put a crystal in the center of the board and the teams have to rush, grab it, and bring it back to their own scoring zone. Uh, just the other day, I tried a scenario called Sheep Soccer. Uh, this is a silly game where sheep spawn at the end of every round and you earn points by getting them over to the opponent's starting zone. But in that one, you can't pick them up. You can only push them. So that was a lot of fun. There are just a ton of different scenario types. So I think one of the most interesting factors in this game is the variety in the box. Mm -hmm. We've covered other games like the 8-bit box, for instance, that do yep. the video game thing and have a few different options and, and games to play. But the sheer volume of potential in this one game box is really impressive. Oh, I agree completely. Now, I first got to see this, uh, see the brilliance of Quad Heroes at a demo night at the CG Realm, a local game store here in Windsor, Ontario. Uh, Ryan Eiler, the designer, got a hold of me and was thought I actually worked at the CG Realm, which happens all the time because I do run events there, and wanted to do a demo there leading up to Gen Con so we could get practice doing demo nights, which I thought was really cool. So I hooked Ryan up with Ian at the CG Realm. They got together, they picked a date, and they had a game night. And that looked like a ton of fun like i think at one point they had four different games going each with like four to six players playing it like it just started off on one table and everyone's like like this game just looks cool like it draws a crowd 
and he had a ton of games going. Everyone who played the game seemed to enjoy it. Now, I admit I didn't play the game that night because I knew I was taking home a review copy and I'm like, I can play it whenever I want. So I was busy. I think I was playing Terraforming Mars that night. But then I sat down and played the game for the first time with Deanna. And I'll admit she was more reluctant than I was to try this. We played through, there's a, a three, three different scenarios that are part of the intro. And they do a fantastic job of onboarding you. The first one, all you do is tumble and move. There's nothing else. It's just a race to one point in the board. All you worry about is the basic movement of tumble, move, tumble, move, tumble, move. First person to get to the one spot wins. Then the second one adds in more board elements and then adds in the cards. And then the third one adds in the upgrading and the event cards. So you slowly learn the mechanics of the game. It's fantastic. And I got to admit, we are both smitten by this game. Like Deanna as well, who was a little worried about it. Like that tumbling mechanic, it's just brilliant. Like it's, that's, that's the winning move. That's the killer app. That whole, I have a D6 sized character. I turn it to a side and what's facing up is what I do that turn is so awesome. But that's not all Quad Heroes had to offer. The gameplay itself is tight and solid. The onboarding was great. The component quality is like up there. It's like mechs versus minions good. Like the, the boards have that UV coating on parts of them. The water looks slick. The All of the miniatures were giving uh, ink wash treatment. So they really pop like really nice looking stuff in this box. Yeah, I mean, while well, having a great gimmick can be an awesome selling point. It can really grab people in. It's rarely enough to keep a game on the table. Uh, that takes a great overall design. And that's where this game really seems to be shining and stepping up and delivering what is beyond an already great game mechanic mm -hmm. in the tumbling. So after our first couple plays, play a two-player, uh, it was Deanna who suggested that our kids would probably dig this game. So that's when, like I already liked the game, but when it really started to shine was once we broke it out with the kids. Now, while both kids enjoy the game, my oldest daughter is, I would say, in love with this game. Now she loves programming and coding and she's a huge fan of games like Robo Turtles and Robo Rally. And she spends far too many hours a day programming in Scratch now on, on our tablet. Now I will say, and, and Ryan had to correct me on this, this isn't a programmed movement game, but it feels like one. And I don't know how to describe it, but the whole planning your move, uh, one of the brilliant things Ryan did is he includes two cubes for each character, one that's on the board and another one to hold in your hand. Because while you're planning out your movement, you can manipulate that one in your hand to kind of see where you are. It's brilliant. So something about that holding the cube in your hand and go, okay, I tumble this way, then I'm going to slide three this way and I'm going to hit a spring, which is going to just, it, it like sets off the same neurons as games like Robo Rally do. Like it just feels like a program movement to get to game to me. And Oh my God, does Big G love, like she loves the game. Yeah, there's a real thought process to working out how to get your tumble to a certain side upwards so that at a certain point that engages, you know, and, and it just works those logics, those same logic mm -hmm. centers as the programming because you do need to think ahead and you're not oh, yeah. planning, but that, that, that thinking ahead to try and figure out, so, well, when I get here, I'm going to want this side up so that I can slide and, yep. you know, do that sort of thing is, is that same logic, uh, you know, brain centers that the, the programming uh, works out. Now, if I did have to find fault with Quad Heroes, I will say that this game is fiddly. Uh, mainly due to the sheer volume of components you get in the box. Trying to find the right tiles, markers, and tokens for each scenario can take a significant amount of time. Now, I will say this has probably come up before because I've noticed on Board Game Geek that fans have complained about it. And one of the things the designer has done is showing his preferred method of bagging and storing the components so that like all the stuff for using sheep are in one bag and all the moving platform stuff go here and all of the board elements that can be randomized go in this bag. Like this is a file that if you go, if you see the blog version of this review, I got a link to the file that shows Ryan's method of bagging the game. Now I got a demo copy, so it came that way. And I've got to say, when I first got it, I was like, why are these all in separate bags? And I put them in a plano and I've since taken them back out because it, his method was definitely better than what I came up with. Yeah, so poking around, there aren't any official inserts yet available, though Ryan has said he will design one for a separate, uh, available for separate sale if the game goes into reprint on Kickstarter. Okay. Now, additionally, there are some foam core and 3D print designs on Board Game Geek 
that really uh, have, have like the 3D printed design, I found it especially really breaks things out yeah. really nicely. Multi layered, multi tiered, uh, little air, areas where you can, where you can, you can stack the, the tokens so that you can pull them out individually. Like, nice. There's some really nice inserts designed out there, just none you can purchase, unfortunately. Yeah, fair enough. If people are willing to do your own or get a hold of someone who's doing it themselves, and I'm sure if you give them enough money, they'll send you a pre built insert for it. Yeah. Now, the fiddliness does also go to the rules for uh, for a bit here. So there are a large number of powers and abilities here. So you have 11 different characters. They all have their own Q abilities, but then you have the different upgrade tokens for each of those characters. Then there's this really cool buddy system that I, I didn't really get into detail with, but it's a way to be able to control more than one character and keep it uh, easy to do. And it, they have different abilities in the base character. So there's just like a ton of icons and things you have to learn. And that can be overwhelming. And it can be difficult to try to find where they are because some of this is on the player reference cards. Some of it's in the rule books. Some of it's in one section of the rule books and some's in another. Now I will say in pretty much every case that came up, it was there. Like the rule was there. I just had to find it. Yeah. Um, in addition to this, Ryan has a very solid FAQ up at quadheroes.com that does go over most of the missed or misunderstood rules. And what's good, important to know here is this, none of the rules were missing. It was just a matter of trying to find them, which sometimes took more time than I would have liked. Right. Well, and again, we've got another designer going out there and making sure the post-delivery support of their games is solid. And we really, you know, that's always great to see, especially when, again, this isn't missing stuff. This is just helping you play it better yeah. by giving you a little help on organization of things. Now, overall, uh, it's been a huge hit in our household. Um, this has a lot more going to it for it than just some cute cube-like characters and the neat tumbling mechanic. Uh, Top-notch components combined with excellent, engaging, standardized gameplay that features added variety due to the number of distant scenarios and scenario types out there. This is a game that can be just as fun playing through a campaign solo, which is one of the options in the book, as it is playing a four-player game of sheep soccer. Uh, I know most people have probably either never heard of Quad Heroes or overlooked it, and I gotta say that's a shame. I think everyone should give this game a shot like this due to the huge range of gameplay types and options for player count and player style. You even have the overlord, the, the DM style with one player versus the rest of the table that's in there. It's all there where the players are trying to sneak in a castle and steal sheep and the overlords trying to stop you from doing that. That is one of the scenarios available. This is one, if there is some way like a con season, unfortunately this year does not exist, but if you can get out to a con and see this game, I think you'll probably find something you'll like. All right, well, for a more in-depth look at Quad Heroes, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Up next, a look at Shadowrun 6th Edition Beginner Box from Catalyst Game Labs, the newest introduction to the world of Shadowrun and its new 6th edition. Catalyst Game Labs, after some cajoling, provided <laughs> us a review copy of Shadowrun 6th Edition Beginner Box no other compensation was provided. Yeah, I'll admit I had to work for this one. This they, they did not want to give me this box set. So hopefully, hopefully this makes them happy with that. So the Shadowrun 6 World Beginner Box was designed by O.C. Presley, was published by Catalyst Game Labs in 2019. And this I had no idea, but is fascinating to me. Under license from Tops, yes, the playing card or collective, what are you, uh, trading card, trading, trading card. card company. They own the rights to Shadowrun. I had no idea. Well, the best way to see what you get in this RPG box set is to check out our Shadowrun Six World Beginner Box unboxing video over on YouTube, a link to which we will be sure to put in the show notes. Now, I got to say, reviewing an RPG is quite different from reviewing a board game, and reviewing an RPG box set is even different from that. So what I think I'm going to do today is go through each of the different things you give in the box sharing my thoughts on each as I go. And then at the end, I'll do kind of an overall impression. Now, what I do need to note, and this is important, is this is what I call a read review. Due to the global pandemic, I have not gotten a chance to actually sit down and play this RPG box set. If and when that actually happens, what I'll probably do is publish a follow-up actual play review. But for now, you'll just have to go on what I thought from looking at, touching, and reading what you get in this box set. Now, even outside conditions like this, read reviews are not uncommon and help to set expectations without coloring 
the, the, the coloring that a specific group's style might bring to a game when they inevitably start poking at it from all different directions. I said, just want to make it clear, I've only read this one. So, again, I'm just going to go through what you get in this box set bit by bit with my thoughts on each. So, first off, you get a great two-sided what to read next page. Now, this is something that, in my opinion, should be in every box set that's ever been made, possibly even most board games, especially if there's multiple books or multiple sets of contents. And this particular one does a good job of telling you where to start and what you need to do to play as soon as possible. So, even what you could skip over if you really just want to get the game to the table. There is nothing worse than getting a big hunk of reading, settling down, and a hundred pages in, find out that the book you thought made sense to read first relies heavily on that other book over there you mm -hmm. haven't touched yet. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that one. Next, you've got the dice. Now, these are some sweet-looking purple on black custom dice. Now, Shadowrun always has been, since the start, continues to be a D6 dice pool base game. I think anyone out there that knows Shadowrun knows it. It's one of those games where you need tons of dice. Now, in the system, which I'll dive into further, ones can lead to glitches, and fives and sixes are hits. So these particular dice feature this traditional Shadowrun horned skull. It's something off the original first edition book. That replaces the ones. Now, the fives and sixes have this Shadowrun S. It's this Aztec-looking snake that's there along with the fives and sixes. So it just makes it clear to see if you have a potential glitch or hits. Otherwise, they're standard D6. And really, you can't go wrong giving a role player more dice. And since it is a beginner box, you need to make sure that those players don't need anything else in case yes. they really are trying this as their first ever game. And I totally agree. And I'm sure Ryan in the chat will bring it up. No, it does not come with a pencil, which is something he has complained in the past that RPG beginner boxes always claim to give you everything you need, but don't give you pencils. This does not. I apologize. Sorry, Catalyst did not give us pencils. So the next thing in the box is a four page pamphlet entitled An Instant Guide to the Sixth World. Now this tells you a bit about the Shadowrun setting in particular, this new sixth edition has a sixth world. Uh, it talks about how everything has a price. That's a big push for Shadowrun. Details what it means to be a Shadowrunner because Shadowrun is in particular a very different game than, say, Cyberpunk 2020. In Shadowrun, you play a Shadowrunner who is someone who is hired by corporations to do runs against other corporations. It's a set expectation. Uh, it gives you a timeline for the setting and then points out 10 of the biggest corporations with a focus on how one of the ones from the previous setting no longer is and there's a new big 10. I got to say I was a little disappointed with this one because... I have previously reviewed the fifth edition box set, which you'll be able to find links on the blog and you can read that up. And I found this disappointing as an intro to the setting. While this did give me an idea of what the game was about, it didn't make me excited. Like I wasn't like, oh, that sounds awesome. I was just like, okay, yeah, here's these 10 corporations. And it told me how many employees they have and what their stock market ticker was. But it didn't tell me who as technology is or why I would care. So I thought that was the last box did much better job detail setting intro and like it even included part of a run novel just did a better job of getting me excited about the world also i take issue with anything that's called instant and requires four pages of reading <laughs> yeah i guess that's not instant they expect you to just plug it in and download it to your cortical stack that's the problem and i just i didn't have mine handy uh up next are four character dossiers you've got zip file the dwarf decker you, the Elf Covert Ops Specialist slash Face, Frostburn, the Orc Combat Mage, and Rude, the Troll Street Samurai. Uh, these dossiers are honestly the highlight of this box set. Each is seven pages long and starts off with basically a character sheet in the middle of two pages with all these callouts on the outside telling you how to read it. Every detail on that character sheet is explained clearly and concisely. In addition to mechanics on the first couple pages, there's a whole section on background, who this character is, who their contacts are, who their friends are, a section on preferred tactics, so how to play the character tactically, and role-playing tips for each character. Now, each book also has an example shadow run in the back of it, which is a short story, which is supported by a sidebar that shows how the mechanics of the game apply to that story. Finally, every character has a bunch of specific tables that are important to that player class. So for example, the orc mage has the tables for casting spells, whereas the street samurai doesn't. I gotta say, these are a huge improvement 
over the dossiers from the fifth edition box set. The fifth edition box set were full fifth edition characters with all the skills, all the bits and bobs, all the numbers, everything there that left so many unanswered questions that you didn't get answers to until you bought the full reset rule set. Like it was just, there's so much on there that wasn't used for the quick start. It was terrible here. Every detail is explained, even if some of them were just to say, these rules aren't used in the box set, but use this as a role-playing prompt. And see, this is something that is amazing for onboarding new players with. In games like this, it might sound fun to play a combat mage, but there could very well be a lot of mechanics that can make it overwhelming and result in players just saying, uh, maybe I'll just play a fighter today or you know, mm -hmm. what the equivalent in, in, in any given game hesitate to try that class that may fit better with them their style mm -hmm. their personality but seems like a lot of work whereas this you've got all that information so yep. well laid out right there for you to make it an easy step in oh i agree the onboarding here is top notch now along with the character box this goes right with that is a significant deck of cards 55 in total these include gear, weapons, cyber decks, drones, armor, a vehicle, basically anything the characters could use during the game. And when you go through the dossier, it literally says, grab these cards for your character. And then there's also, on the GM side, a number of NPC cards for the major players in the Battle Royale, which I'll be talking about in a bit. Now, I do admit, I really wish these cards had some art on them, because they are just pure text and tables, but I got, I'm just so happy to see them. Like, yeah, Shadowrun has so many years of art. Why is there not art? But you know what? I love having cards during RPGs. I would much rather reference the card that's right in front of me than have to look up something in a rule book. Yeah, this is an aspect of RPGs that I wish had been there when I was actively playing them. The idea of not having to have books and tables and charts full of items and spells and whatnot, and just being able to have exactly what my character has right mm -hmm. there in front of me in my hand, it's fantastic. I, I don't understand the people who don't like using things like that, like cards. It makes no sense to me. You're not allowed to make things easier. If it's not hard, it's not work. It's not playing. Yeah, maybe. Know. Maybe <laughs> that's what it is. I don't know. I don't know what it is. So next, we have the actual quick start rules. Uh, this is the biggest book in the box, the biggest chunk. Um, this explains the rules sixth edition of Shadowrun. Now that's way more than I'm going to get into here because this is a 24 page book and it's dense. There's a lot of text, not a lot of pictures. Um, and I don't need to get into every little detail, but what I will do is just give a brief overview. So your basic system. And as far as I know, this is one that's never changed in Shadowrun is that you have stats and skills. And when attempting to do something, you build a dice pool based on one skill and one stat. You just add the numbers together and grab that many dice. You then roll that pool. You count fives and sixes as hits. And you're trying to beat a threshold set by the DM. So you want to get more hits than whatever the DM set. Or if you're playing against, like, a, if you're in a fight or it's an opposed role, you're trying to get more hits than your opponent or your opposed role. Now, this edition of the game does have some story game elements that are new to Shadowrun. First off is what they call the glitch system. If you roll more ones, then you roll successes, a glitch happens. And what blew me away here is that I would have expected a botch system. To me, I'm thinking traditional role-playing game. I roll too many ones. I botch something stupid's going to happen. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot or my gun's going to break or something. But that's not it in this game. What a glitch means in this edition of Shadowrun is that something interesting happens, which is in addition to succeeding or failing on your die roll. And that fact of, that, that's something very story gamey, right? It's the, I made it, I succeeded, but, or I failed and. I love seeing that. So, this, we're at four pages, plus another seven for each character, before we get to the quick start that's 24 more yep. pages. Uh, <laughs> now, this is actually one of my big complaints about any dice pool system. Complexity. Uh, learning how and build, to do it and building dice pools, while a great mechanic. It's, it's a fan. I, you know, I love a lot of these di dice pool games. It's going to be harder than roll a d20 against this stat or roll a d20 against this number it you just can't avoid it uh and for play i've had players especially when looking at uh, doing online gaming indicate that there's a uh, concern about the speed bumps introduced by pausing to sort of build, figure out what your dice pool is going to be and and what the complex you know what the difficulty mm -hmm. level is going to be and do all that whereas you could just say 
roll me against a difficulty 17 in a more standard dice system. Again, I, 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 so, I do but... love the dice pool system, but it's something I've been, I've been seeing lately. So to add to that, the, again, going back to onboarding, in those character sheets, they have done all the math. And I talked about how every character sheet has a set of tables specific to them. They have one of those tables are standard dice rolls. And it's all the dice rolls they expect a player playing that character to make while playing the adventure in this book with all the math done. Right. So this does remove it. But if you were playing the full game, you would be doing that whole stat plus thing gives me a dice pool of X yeah. every time. Now, there is one other very much story game element added to this. And I'm kind of wishing Jeff Seuss was in our chat room for this one. And that is Edge. Edge is a resource that all players have, all characters have, and it's, it's I don't know how they determine. There is no character generation, so that's worth noting. Um, it's set at whatever level. And at the start of each situation or each scene, each thing you're about to start rolling for, you have an edge set that gives you amount of edge. And they recommend using like poker chips or something to track this. There are spots in the character sheet you can mark off, but I would definitely use something. And you start with your set edge, and every round you can earn up to two more. Now, edge is earned, well, for having an edge, which to me fits really well in a Shadowrun cyberpunk game. If you have an edge on your opponent, you get another edge point, right? So if you have better gear, so one of the things you do is you compare your attack rating on your weapon to the defense rating of your opponent's armor. If your attack rating is more than four, higher than the defense rating, you get an edge. That's mechanically how it works. Being prepared can give you an edge. Having things like cover can give you edge. Being out in the rain might give edge to one side versus another. Having the right cyberware and so on. There's all kinds of ways to earn edge. Now, edge is spent to do things like modify the die rolls, hit automatically, create special effects, and so on. And this is the biggest new thing to this edition of Shadow's Edition. And this is what, for fans, from what I've seen online, is the deal breaker or the, the wonderful new thing. This is causing so much division in the fan community. People love or hate Edge. Now, I got to say, reading it, it sounds interesting. Though I got to say, abstracting things like gunpowder versus armor into a simple you has Edge who does not, really doesn't sound like Shadowrun to me. Like it's always been one of those crunchy gear based games. And that just sounds like it's simplifying it to a level that doesn't feel like Shadowrun anymore. But I've only read the book. So this is part of the system. This is, I think the biggest part of the system that I can't judge until I actually see it used at the table. Now it's interesting because again, I've been reading the cyberpunk game, Hack the Planet lately, uh, which is Forged in the Dark System. And this concept of edge, while different than, than what's done uh, in Forge of the Dark seems very uh, familiar to me as yeah. it's part of the mechanical system in that Forge to the Dark where you're using general comparisons rather than fiddling with every detail. Now, it sounds a little bit like Shadowrun may have sort of kept a lot of the fiddling in there to get the comparisons done mm. uh, because, again, Shadowrun's a little more of an older school system compared to the Forge of the Dark system. Mm. But uh, in, in a lot of this, the Forge to the Dark, these newer story games, what you're getting is this abstraction where it doesn't matter that this corp uses these armor and these guns and these things and you use this, this, and this. No, the DM says, look, they've got an edge over you by two, so your difficulty shifts by two. And that's, yeah. that's just how it is. Now, again, Shadowrun, being an older school, has taken that and mechanicized yes. it a little bit. So mm -hmm. there, there's, there's still the mechanics and the abstraction, um, whereas Forge in the Dark tends to just go straight to the abstraction. The GM says, no, this is a tier three uh, team. You're a tier one team. It's two levels yeah. of difficulty between you, period. I still say it's surprising to see in a game like Shadowrun. It's, it's an interesting progression of the system. But like you said, it's still crunchy. It's still got that crunch. But to me, like having full cover, all it does is give me plus one edge just didn't seem I, I i am not i am more of a story gamer that like i'm not a realist but it just feels like if i have full cover i should have like some defensive bonus other right. than i get one edge right like it just it, it's so abstracted but again i have no clue maybe at the table this works fantastic maybe at the table i'd hate it right so this leads me up to the battle royal adventure book i mentioned this earlier um my biggest complaint about Shadowrun 5th edition box set was the included adventure because this is Shadowrun. This is a game 
about doing shadow runs, getting hired by Mr. Johnson to do a job and then do the job and then get paid for it. Instead of having a run, it was a firefight in a 7-Eleven called the Stuffer Shack. Now I've since learned the Stuffer Shack is a shout out to a staple of Shadowrun as it was the adventure in the back of the original softcover rulebook. So I get it. If you're a Shadowrun fan, it's like, oh, look, the Stuffer Shack. But it just wasn't a good way to me to introduce new players to the setting. I'm like, you're Shadowrunners, show a Shadowrun. Now, I don't know if someone read my review of the last one or heard us complain on the podcast or if it wasn't just me that complained, but this new Six World box set has completely fixed that problem. Well, it's not a traditional shadow run. There's no meet Mr. Johnson. Battle Royal is a full adventure. In keeping with tradition, though, I thought this was cute. It does start off in the Stuffer Shack, but very quickly moves on to an extraction mission in the middle of a four-sided gang turf war. Now, the adventure is written well, uh, features the possibility of multiple vectors to get through it, including combat, talking, or stealth, or a combination of all of the above, which hopefully, I'm, I, again, I've only read it. I would hope players playing through would do more of the things, but you could just focus on one of those three vectors. Um, my hope would be the group splits up and each does their own thing, and then you get to see all the different sides. Um, my only complaint, though, is what I mentioned about that setup, that this seems like it could be a bit much for a new GM. You got four different, as far as I can tell, well-known Shadowrun gangs from like previous editions or stories that have four different lieutenants. The gangs all have different stats. They all have different equipment. The lieutenants have their own personalities. They're potentially all about to fight each other at once with the players stuck in the middle. And that seems like an awful lot for a new DM to to take care of like to, to manage now i will admit they did provide cards for all the major players you got a card for each gang and then you have a card for each lieutenant and then there's cards excuse me there's cards for all the equipment but i don't know i that seems like a lot to keep track of again i haven't run it i haven't played it at the table i haven't seen it maybe i'm wrong but it seems like it could be overwhelming yeah it almost sounds like they're leaning towards fresh players but with a gm who's not quite as green as those players are yeah that's highly possible too like i, th I have a feeling that again i think the marketing on this for a, a, for a lot of the shadowrun products are this is being sold to shadowrun fans so that could be part of it now the the last thing in the box is a nice two-sided poster map uh one side has a map of the seattle sprawl this is uh, the default setting for shadowrun and has been for years and on the other are a bunch of maps for the battle royal adventure which i really appreciate because the last version of this box did not have that the best part though and i tested this myself is it felt like it had plastic coating sure enough it does and this works with dry erase markers that is awesome having a dry erase marker map in the box that is awesome and this is a nice touch that i honestly would not expect in a beginner box where you kind of figure the materials are going to be one and done because they want you to buy the full system once you're happy with it so that's everything you get in the box so my thoughts on it so straight up this is way better than the fifth edition, like almost in every way. I reviewed the fifth edition starter set. Deanna dropped a link in the chat. We'll throw a link in the show notes. At this point, I don't know who would want to go back to fifth edition anyway, but I'm sure there are purists out there. Overall, this is just a better onboarding system to the Shadowrun world. This is so much better to onboard players to the mechanics of the game. Now, it doesn't include a ton of information that isn't explained, which is nice. There was nothing that isn't used. And it includes a full adventure, which is so much better than just a fight in a stuffer shack. Now, well, the last starter set might have been good for getting Shadowrun players into a new edition. And that was pretty much my end. My overall thoughts on the last one was this is probably a great box to get people who haven't played Shadowrun in years back into the into the game. I think this is a great box to get people who have never played Shadowrun into this new world. It is definitely better geared towards people experiencing Shadowrun for the first time. Now, that said, the one thing the old box I found actually did better was to hook players on the world, the, the setting of Shadowrun. This Sticks World starter set seemed to lack something to get you excited to be a Shadowrunner, something that made me want to explore the world. Now it did have that little four page book with some setting material and the back of the stuffer shack or, or sorry, not the stuffer shack, the, the adventure has a bunch of descriptions of the different sections of Seattle. There just wasn't a lot to draw you in. Whereas the fifth edition box set 
had much more detailed setting information and even included a short novella. Like there are tons of Shadowrun novels out there. And it was also a good way to even promote the fact that you could buy Shadowrun novels. I would have liked to have seen something like that into this box set. Well, I guess at some point they need to figure out what to cut from the box or it's no longer a beginner box. Yeah. It's just the DM guide with handouts. Uh, they do seem like they're trying to find the balance, though, even if from version to version they're teetering yeah. one way and then the other on some things. No, I totally agree. Now, I am happy to say that if you've ever been curious about checking out Shadowrun, this is a solid way to dive in the latest version, the latest this spot is great for getting into the mechanics right away and playing quickly now if you're already a Shadowrun fan i'm not sure you need this one like this really is made for new players the basic concepts are going to be mostly what you remember i think if the main thing you want to learn about is this new edge system there are plenty of people talking about it online i don't think you need this box to explain it to you you can easily find that online if you're thinking of checking out the new sixth edition you're probably better off now that it's out just pick start right with the core handbook though there is some neat bits in here right so if you want some cool looking dice and that nice seattle sprawl map maybe it's worth picking up the box set for that well for a more in-depth look at Shadowrun sixth edition beginner box you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? All right, every week we like to take this look back and look at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff going on. And this week, all I really want to talk about is a rather big event, and that would be Gen Con Online. Now, I sort of took part. I bought a badge. They were free. I signed up for a badge. Um... And I did similar to what I did for Virtual Gaming Con, which was uh, from, from Board Game Geek and the Dice Tower, as well as Renegade Con Online, which was put on by Renegade Games. I basically spent the best four days in gaming with multiple tabs open to various Twitch channels and a couple YouTube live streams. Now, due to feeling under the weather for most of the week, I didn't end up playing any actual games. I had actually signed up to do a demo of a couple games, but I ended up backing down because my voice wasn't holding out and it's coughing a little too much. So, But what I did do is I actually sat through some game demos. I didn't play myself, but I sat through them, uh, multiple panels, some interviews and stuff like that. Unfortunately, my schedule was not lining up well with this one. Uh, I did manage to catch a bit of the Ennies, um, which was a fun show Although I really wish people would understand that online production takes time and rehearsal and effort. Um, and while there were some great fun moments and I know people had some, a, a really good time and there were some really funny screen caps out there of some of the mm -hmm. moments from it. Um, overall, with only a little bit more time and effort and, and preparedness, that could have been a whole next level event. And yeah. I hope, uh, you know, for events coming up, because this, you know, we're not we're not getting back to these sort of events anytime soon. There will be more awards shows mm -hmm. uh, held this way. I hope people take a t take some time and, and, and prepare a little more in advance mm -hmm. uh, and, and think of it as, you know, a live performance has, you know, rehearsals and things. To be honest, I highly doubt the Ennies ever had rehearsals. <laughs> live or not just based on having watched them live in person through video Fair. um i don't <laughs> think they ever really had any rehearsals what they could have really used though was explaining to the hosts what was going to happen how it was going to happen what they would be able to hear and what they wouldn't um there was some the the first half of the show was rather painful with people talking over top of each other and inappropriate laughter and comments in the middle of presentations and i it was a little rough i gotta admit though i loved the fact they were done this way because they were over quickly like the last time i sat through the live ennies i swear it was at, like it went till after midnight because as they announced every person who won they had to play their theme music and then they had to walk up to the stage and then they gave their thank you speech and then they had to walk back and then the next host all that was gone online which was awesome so what they would do is you had the hosts who were live would just read off the reward they would play a short video and they move to the next one and the speed the ennies went through was very enjoyable it, it was a much more succinct experience which i appreciated despite the technical difficulties all right 
So what I want to talk about here in particular is I'm just going to do some highlights, right? So I, I don't want to talk about everything I did. I sat through a lot of stuff. <laughs> so first off, I want to talk about three games I'm excited about. So these are... Th- As we pause briefly for the coughing fit. Brought to you by the letter is C O V I T. Um, yes. We don't know that it's COVID. It may just be pneumonia. Slowly, recovery will come. All right, sorry about that. All right, so what I want to talk about here are three games that I ended up excited about by the end of the weekend. I watched so many demos. Like, it was crazy. They had one channel, and it was actually Board Game Geek who was doing it. It was through the Gen Con Twitch, but it was Board Game Geek that hosted it. And what they did is Board Game Geek every year at Gen Con at Origins sets up this demo area where they just constantly run through demos and they broadcast them on the front of the board game geek page, which they were probably doing with this. Actually, I never checked. So they just constantly had a table going and what they did. And I thought this was kind of brilliant was they had the game set up at board game geek HQ. And then they had a board game geek employee who did interviews talking to whoever was promoting the game and they were in their own little chats, but the game was set up at board game geek HQ. And there were two people taking turns that would move the pieces so it was really interesting. And a lot of the demoers were like, man, I need someone like this at a con because they would just be like, all right. And then you flip over to the top red card and that someone would flip over to the top red card. Now that did lead to some confusion. We're like, no, no, not that one, the one up there. So it was weird. So you had the presenter telling someone else how to manipulate the game. So I was weird. It, it was, it was an interesting way to do it. And they just ran demos. Like it was every half hour was a new game. And then uh, most of the weekend, but then they had 15 minute segments for quicker games. And then they had hour segments for these big long games. So I sat through a bunch of these. And out of that, there were three games that really stuck out as I'm like, I need these. These are on my wish list. These are these are publishers I might try to pitch. Uh, the first was Tekenu, Obelisk of the Sun. A T-based game that's hard to pronounce. You can probably guess who that's from. Because this is from Boards and Dice. This is the follow-up, the same designers as Zolkin and the same designers of Teotihuacan. So this is the, the follow-up to that series. Like that, there is a big thing in the middle of the board that catches your attention, like those other two games. And this is a giant obelisk. And the obelisk and what it is representing is the Tekenu is actually the shadow of the sun is what it means. And this obelisk casts the shadow on part of the board. And at the end of every round, you turn the obelisk and it shows where it's casting the shadow. Uh, It's a dice power, dice drafting style game. There's different colors of dice. The dice are tied to different resources. What dice can be drafted depends on if you're in the sun or in the shadow of the obelisk. Um, You only get 16 actions the entire game. So it's very similar to Teo to walk in that way. We're only going to do so many things. You got personal player boards where you're building um, three different things. I'm trying to remember what the three things are. You, you build uh, whatever there's three different things you're building to get points on you score based on which cards you've drafted you can get more cards um the neat thing in here besides the obelisk is when you draft dice you have a scale on your player board the light and a dark side and when you get the dice you have to put them on the scale at the end of each round which is you get four four dice you then have to look at your scale and see how balanced it is and if it's out of balance you slide either towards the light side or the dark side and going too far on either side was bad for negative points so i thought that was just a neat thing i'd never seen before um it it just seemed cool scoring is all victory point cards really neat looking meaty heavy just what you expect from zolkin tail to walkin and all of those no no um mahjong looking pieces this time but instead this giant obelisk that is in the center of the board and gets turned Interesting. Up next was Tang Garden. Uh, this is by Lucky Duck Games. This is a game about building a Zen garden. You have four players starting in the corners. There are four different elements, which I don't remember off the top of my head. There was air, earth, uh, fire, and water, I think, would be your four elements. You are putting out tiles uh, based on those four elements. You're getting points for connecting them. Uh, very similar to lanterns. So if you match up to earth, you get a point in earth. As well as if you enclose a whole area of earth, you get a point where that kind of reminded me of um, ingenious, where you're going up on the different tracks based on which elements you're completing. 
But what really sold this game, besides this like neat looking tile laying game, was that you could put features on the map. And when you put features, they were 3D cardboard features that just looked amazing. You would have this like nice looking garden growing, but then you put out a 3D pagoda or there's four different species of trees that are all different trees. And these kind of look like the trees from uh, photosynthesis and you put them out there. So you had this, it, it grew to mind games like um, Takedo and, oh, what's the other Japanese? Takan. They just had this Japanese peaceful Zen game with these beautiful tiles and these beautiful gardens. And there's even like 3D parts that you put on the edge of the board that you can kind of kneel down and look and you get this 3D look. And then one of the neatest mechanics was you could put, hire people. You were trying to draw nobles to your garden. And when you place a noble on the board, you have to decide which way they're facing. And then you look to see what they can see. And the more variety they see, the more points you, you get. Like, it's just a lot of neat looking things tied in together. This cool Asian theme with this uh, just great looking Zen feel. I don't know. I just I immediately watch it. I'm like, I watched the whole demo. I'm like, this game just looks awesome. Well, we know what, uh, we know you're going to be a fan of this next one, no matter what it is. Uh, pretty much. So the next one is the latest game from Rainer Nitzia. This is Babylonia. Uh, it's put out by a company I've never heard of before called Ludo Nova. Uh, for all I know, that might be the European publisher, and I don't know if it's coming to North America. Again, I just watched some demos. Uh, this looks like Rainer Nitzia took a bunch of his favorite games, stole mechanics from the, like his own games, and put them all in one place. And the mechanics I saw were from games I really like. This looks like an update to samurai which is a game uh, a japanese themed game a very much math game because it's rainier nitsia where you're surrounding cities with your your t drafted tiles to collect the resources in the middle of them and this is similar that way where you are putting out tokens so you get a, a bunch of face down tokens you get a handful of them every turn you put them out around the board when you surround the city whoever has the most of a token around it is going to take that city everyone else is going to get points for matching the symbols on the city and on the tile you put out so everyone's getting points you're going to try to collect the different cities um it also had an element of Tigris and Euphrates where the different types so there are farmers there were high hats there were different types of tokens that you're putting out and farms can only be taken by farmers and cities can only be taken by other ones and then there's monuments where if you manage to surround a monument you get a bonus power that you could use for the rest of the game um, there was some through the desert elements because when you scored a city, you also scored points for every tile that you, was touching it in a chain. There was just a whole bunch of neat mechanics that I've seen in other Rainier Nitsi games that seemed like you condensed them all and put them all into one new game. And it looked really cool. It just looked like a good use of those mechanics and combining stuff he's previously done in a new way. Interesting. Uh, Ludanova is a Spanish game company okay. uh, that originally published Watson and Holmes. Fair enough. So it's uh it's they don't they they don't seem to have like a bunch of Rainier Nitzia content. So I'm not sure. So that may just be that. But uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. All of these are on Board Game Geek, so you can look them all up. I, all three of these games definitely have them. I probably should have thrown links into the show notes here. We could have looked up each of them at the time. People could have followed along. Uh, up next, there's two particular panels I want to highlight. Uh, the first was Eric Lang and Rob Davio, who both work for Cool Mini or Not Now, talking about what gets them excited making games. The camaraderie between these two game designers was just fantastic. Like, it was one of those where you're sitting there, and it's like they're sitting at a bar having drinks and, like, going, remember when? And that's what it was like. It was like, remember when we did Blood Rage? Oh, do you remember the miniature? Oh, do you remember the problem we had with this? It was just a really enjoyable. Like, if you can find this one after the fact, supposedly all of these interviews, panels, and all these are going to be on YouTube. Um, they might be there already. Sorry, they might be up on YouTube already. I think they were releasing them all at once. Unlike... Um, I know when Renegade did theirs, they staggered their releases so people didn't get swarmed with videos. But from what I understood from the, the closing ceremonies, they were supposed to be dumping all of this video content out there for people to consume. So that one was really cool. Uh, I Fortunately, I didn't take notes to get the actual name of the panel. 
but that was a really good one. Um, there were two people from Kickstarter. There was the head of the games department at Kickstarter and then the person under them, whatever their titles happen to be, uh, that was specific to tabletop gaming. So the, the games person did video games as well as board games and everything. The person under them just did board games talking about making it weird on Kickstarter and how that seems to be the secret of success is doing something different, whether that's offering a unique stretch goal, having um, social media, uh, interaction, meaning something, producing something no one's done before. Um, so that one. Uh, example they actually up with Frosthaven not having any like not just you can buy the game cheaper here and how that only works because it's Isaac and Frosthaven and how the only reason they could get away with not doing anything weird was because they're a known commodity and how important that can be. Um, I specific examples aren't coming to mind right now, but that was a really engaging panel, really interesting to see what people have done to do things different and get people's attention. And that was the whole thing is get people talking, not even necessarily on Kickstarter, not necessarily your backers, but you want people on Twitter or you want people on Facebook going, Hey, have you seen this Kickstarter? They're doing this weird thing and how important that is right now to the success of Kickstarter. Right. That makes sense. Now I did sit through some actual plays, not a lot. Um, I tried to sit through more of them, but I find I, I don't have the attention span to sit through a full actual play. I, I am impressed. Anyone watches us play through Gloomhaven because it's not something I necessarily want to do. So one of the first ones was Scooby-Doo escape from the haunted mansion. Now, there are two Scooby-Doo games out right now that both have mansion in the title. And man, I didn't realize this. So there is a new betrayal at house on the Hill out that is Scooby-Doo betrayal at the haunted mansion or something. And then there's this game. And this is not the Avalon Hill game. Uh, I got confused because the local game store was like, Hey, we got the new Scooby-Doo game. And I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of interested, but you can only play it once. And they're like, what are you talking about? You can only play it once. I'm like, well, now it's a pure co-op. And they're like, it's not a pure co-op. It's one versus <laughs> many. There's still a betrayal. And I'm like, what the heck? So I had to Google it. And I'm like, Oh man, what, who thought of this? Why would you release both of these at Gen Con time at the same time? But they both have the word mansion in them and they're both Scooby-Doo. So it's anyway, this is escape from the haunted mansion. This is from uh, awesome Canadian designers, Sen and Jay. Uh, this is actually, and this is what I didn't get until watching the actual play, an escape room in a box. This is an exit game or an unlock or one of those featuring the Scooby-Doo characters. It is very much a puzzle and a story. It is Yes, you're playing co-op. Yes, you're playing characters. But you are solving puzzles. You are doing logic puzzles. You are having to use the right character to look at the right thing, to get the right clue, to open the right box, to get to the next room. I watched this and saw this, this amazing puzzle using pool cues and a pool table where they actually had little balls and they had to fit them in a box. And like, like this has all the stuff that I have personally enjoyed in the exit games. All here. Um, I don't. I didn't see anything being destroyed, but it is worth knowing this is a one and done. But right. this is a big, like this is a full campaign. This isn't a two hours and you're done. One scenario might take you two hours and you've got so many scenarios in the box. And learning that this is not a co-op Scooby-Doo board game, but rather a puzzle, I want it even more now. Right. Interesting. Uh, another one I watched was Root, the RPG being played by the designers. And I fear if anyone's going to play Root properly, it's going to be people to design the game. And holy cow, is this just a PBTA game? <laughs> and I have started to learn that every PBTA game sounds like every other PBTA game. Like it, uh, there was like, I'll admit, I haven't played Root. Um, nothing felt like Root. It just felt like you're using, okay, roll the dice. Okay, tell me, did they, did they slip up and let something slip? Did they instead give away something you can leverage later? Or did they lie to you? Pick one of two of three things because you rolled a seven. And that's just how the whole game flowed. And I'm sorry to say, I was so much less interested in this game now. Like I, like I dig, I've had fun playing PBTA games, but like they all are really starting to sound the same to me. Like it, like yeah, the moves might have different names, but it's the the offer a player a hard choice or give the player three out of five things. Or and I know one of the core mechanics, one of the core principles of Powered by the Apocalypse, as written by Vincent McGay Baker in in Apocalypse World, is do not mention the name of the move. That it's just supposed to be this ongoing narrative where you talk back and forth. 
and PBTA seems to have moved away from this because this was very much, oh, I have this move. I try to use it. Okay, what's that move? Okay, roll that move. Okay, that move is named this, and I'm pretty sure it says this. And it just didn't have that storytelling back and forth. And it seems like PBTA moving away from the Eclipse World roots, and I don't know if that's in a good way. I, I See, I'm not sure about that because I, I keep hearing that as well. Uh, and again, I haven't played a lot of PBTA, but I've, I've gotten that same, uh, you know, idea from you, where is you play the story and you're not naming the di- the game, the DM or the players are know it well enough that you're moving towards that. And yes, you're doing it, but you're not just coming out right and mm-hmm. saying, I activate power, you know. You're not you're not doing that D and D thing where it's oh I cast this spell sort yeah, exactly. of thing. It, it's it's natural in the story flow, but I am I have to say I am discovering that as much as through PBTA I found modern gaming and discovered that oh wow I actually really kind of like this modern gaming. Mm-hmm. Forged in the dark is more my kind of uh, modern gaming, and so I, I'm looking I'm looking forward to cons coming back again because. I am definitely going to be sitting down mm-hmm. at some Forge in the Dark games. I had some signed up for Breakout, mm-hmm. and I'm really upset that I didn't get to try them because now that I'm learning the system uh, through reading the game, it it makes even more sense than the PBTA stuff right. made to me. All right, uh, next I do want to talk about um, the Discord server. So they did the same thing that all virtual cons are doing. They put up a Gen Con Discord server. It was huge. There were a ridiculous number of rooms. It was very busy. It worked. Uh, the I don't know. It works as a central hub for all things during the con. Uh, again, I didn't enter any of the rooms where there were actual plays going on, but it worked. Um, one of the things that was cool is there were a ton of online Gen Con deals, almost 100 different shops. And what we ended up doing is Deanna mainly basically made a Gen Con online virtual coupon book. Because that was something a lot of people were looking for in the Discord. Everyone was like, well, where are the sales? Where are the sales? And normally, if you go to the con, you get this coupon book that tries to encourage you to go to various booths and get pins and get trade things in for discounts or whatever. So we made one of those, which is pretty cool. And what's kind of neat is some of those are still active. Like as of today, we are still up to almost 50 shops still doing it. And many are running their sales till up till Friday. So we're going to drop a link in the chat for those of you live. Uh, for those of you listening on Tuesday, I don't know. Now it'll be a week after, so I don't know if any of them will still be going. But we're going to keep that coupon book up while it's there, just because why not? Um, when you're talking about Discord, I have to say, please, if you are running Discords, whether it for a manufacturer, a, pro- a production agent, please be gentle with your at everyone mentions or at oh. your mentions and things. Um, again, I wasn't available this weekend, but we are part of the Renegade Games Discord. And that's great. We're media there. We get notifications of their actual plays and things, but they dump so many at everyone mentions into mm-hmm. their Discord. Uh, my Discord's blowing up and I, it, it's really hard to mute. The, the, you know, the muting the channel doesn't work. You've got, and, but I don't want to, you know, block off the entire thing because we are media. I want to be involved in them, but I want to be able to go and look and not get a thousand mentions uh, mm-hmm. because of their, their use of the, the, the blasts. No, I agree. I see that. A lot. I, I'll admit I use them on ours, but usually it's once a week on Wednesday to say, Hey, come join us live. Yeah. Uh, that's about it. Like I, it was okay. It, it was, it was as good as the renegade. I don't know. Renegade might've done a few things a little bit better. Again, I didn't try any games. Um, they, the one thing that, that is going to hurt all of these that they kept pushing and I'm bad. I, I was bad for this is they keep insisting people buy tickets. So every one of these I watched, I was supposed to buy a ticket for and turn in at the end of the event. And I'll admit I didn't do it. And that's the biggest problem they're going to have with broadcasting things publicly is who's going to take the time and they're like, you have to do it. That way, Jen O'Connell know what was popular. And I'm like, can't they just look at the number of views? Like, yeah. they have that info. It's all on their Twitch. Why Why also require a ticket? Like, that was a – that I don't, I don't know how many people were willing to do it. I mean, I'll I admit I didn't were, do it. I, I, I bought a ticket to the event. I knew they were requiring tickets to play because GMs weren't supposed to start the game until everyone yeah. turned in their tickets. But for watching, not just yeah. uh, watching on public like Twitch if, and things – what yeah. gonna, like whatever. if I went to the demo for Scooby Doo, I was supposed to have bought a ticket for Scooby Doo, right? And then turn it in by the end. Like I watched hours of stuff before they even realized you were supposed to do this. Right. And then someone had set up a Nightbot pound ticket 
and was like, oh, or bang, sorry, bang ticket. And it would keep reminding people, right. go get your tickets and turn them in. And I get it. Like they want that, that detail, but they should be able to get that from Twitch. Like the viewers are there. They can see how many people yeah, are well, they, But they want, they, they want more than just the view numbers. They want uh, your information. If you buy tickets, you've got your information. Yeah, but I bought a ticket to the event. I will admit I did that. Not, I'm yeah, sure but, there but were But they want a link. I mean, the more yeah, data yeah. they get, the better they're on there, yeah, right? It's, it's all about the more data. And if they can link a ticket to an event, that means they've got you linked to that event and yeah, they can fair. sell that to the, you know, the publisher. Well, I don't think they sell the stuff, but they, they let the vendors know or whatever, right? They can yeah. tell Renegade this many people watch for this many hours and this many of them were male and they were from the U.S. Yeah. or they were from And they mean, even if they're not selling that, that's still a value added yeah. that's getting like, that. So I, don't, I don't think Gen Con's data harvesting to sell. That's yeah. just... But, but they're bringing that data, that, you know, yeah. they're, they're getting value added uh, from that information that they are using, then using to bring those publishers back again because, oh, look at all this great information we've got. Now, if, if you want to get rid quick come up with the twitch where people have to pay to get in somehow <laughs> like like offer that to online cons by next year because that that would be the next step where i did need a ticket to get in and it somehow verifies my ticket to let me watch that stream because yeah. all the cons would pay you for that i am certain well and there there are ways but not twitch it's it's like there well, are as systems, i said it would have yeah. to be something else right yeah but uh because i've actually gone to podcasts um uh kevin smith's uh co-host for um hollywood babylon has a subscribes to some service and i don't remember the name of it mm -hmm. but you have to get a ticket in order to get in to watch this live podcast they did in yep uh things so it's there yeah, i don't it, it's it, it, i'm sure it's there it just it's subscription like stuff because i think it was actually like it's like an at&t service or something so it's not yeah. cheap either but. And to be at Deanna's point out, it's possible. I attended stuff I was supposed to pay for. A whole bunch of the stuff cost money and a whole bunch was free and I couldn't tell you which. I would hope none of the stuff that was streamed on Twitch they were charging people for. But be, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> like I didn't, like if I had done a game demo, it would have cost money. Like they were charging to do events, but yep. I just basically sat in rooms, which normally you would pay for at Gen Con. Like just like Origins. If you go to a panel at Origins, you do have to pay for it. Right. It's one of the things I think make Breakout awesome is to me that stuff should be free. But I get it. You got to pay your guests, right? Absolutely. Like, so it all makes sense. I, I don't know. I think I scammed Gen Con. I don't feel like I did. Hopefully I didn't. Yes, I know they wanted me to buy tickets, but I figure that was just for information they might have had anyway. All right. Well, how about a look anyway. ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right. The main thing I'm looking forward to is feeling better. I'm hoping that happens sooner rather than later. This has gone on a little too long. Uh, it'll be two weeks on Thursday um i want need to get jaws of the lion unboxed um i'd like to have that up by this monday so we'll see i and we'll see how i am tomorrow maybe i can get it done friday i don't know if we can get it done quick enough there's a small chance deanna and i may live stream a game on friday since friday was our thing for gloomhaven but i have a feeling that's probably going to be a week from friday thing not this friday at this rate um our next review scheduled were talisman batman super villain edition and runaway hirelings uh those are totally going to depend on the results of my covid test for one because my mother-in-law and sister-in-law who i would be playing bass talis excuse me talisman with are high risk so and in even if the test is negative it'll depend on how i'm feeling so i don't want to make any promises on those um Runaway Hirelings, I plan to run for some of our Patreon patrons at some point. Again, it's going to depend on how I'm feeling. Now, what I probably will get played is I got Roll for Lasers here. That's a really simple, quick game. I should be able to fit that in. Um, that might even be one where we do three reviews in a week because it'll be quick enough. It's a nice, simple game. Uh, I might be able to fit that in before next week. We'll see. Um, possibly even like Braid Dancing Meeple. If I can get that unboxed, I don't think this is going to be a long review like Shadowrun. <laughs> Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Uh, Jeff Seuss. Thanks, Jeff. Kator, Kat and Tori. Thank you. Duran Barnett. Thank you. Timothy, Timothy Smith. Thanks, Timothy. And William Fisher. Thank you. Well, that was the double belt. All right, that means my shift's coming to an end. I'm going to have to lock those front doors and get some sleep. Well, the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the...
content we've been providing and would like to support our continued efforts creating this content, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show, which will almost certainly knock us off the channel and come back again. Oh, yes, of course. For Tabletop Bellhop uh, Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Game on. on.